Hi, welcome back everybody to the dog cooking stream, to the dog cooking show. If you're watching this live, it is a currently a Tuesday stream. We have a little special Tuesday stream because we're going to be missing a couple of days. Everybody, welcome on in. If you're watching this live, it is 5 p.m. the EDT, Tuesday, April 30th. Hello, hello, hello. I see that we have Operator Emma, we have Liam, we have Tazuraki, the one and only. Hello to Trash Can Cat Mom. Hello to Patrick Riso. Hello to WW. Hello to Good Weirdo. Hello, hi to everybody that I did not get a chance to say hi to yet. Also, hi to G Spent Gaming. Welcome on in. It's good to have all of you. Also, Plant Era 04. Thank you so much for the Prime sub. Very sweet of you. Very kind. Also, hi, Jack. Welcome on in, as always. Guys, it's good to see all of you. Um, so really quickly, also Thynatos, welcome to the show. How'd you find the stream? Uh, also to Kishma9. Uh, so guys, welcome on in. Uh, really quickly, I apologize for missing the Sunday stream. As many of you may have seen either on the Discord or on Twitter, I was out sick for a few days. I might still be a little bit under the weather. I'm like currently 95% functional at the moment. Uh, so, so we're almost there. We're almost there, but you know, we'll, we'll hang in there. We'll do, we'll do okay today. So it's good to see all of you. I missed you all so much. So everybody really quickly, before we begin today, we're going to be doing the back to back today and tomorrow. So this is the uncommon Tuesday stream. Usually we do Wednesdays, Fridays, and Sundays. I'm going to be out this Friday, this Sunday. So if you want to catch me, the last day to do it is tomorrow until I'll be back next week because I will be out of town for a little bit. Also, I'm just setting my AC really quickly. Also, hi, it's good to see all of you. So everybody, I'm really excited about today's stream because we're going to be doing something that I think everybody messes up. This is one of the dishes. This is one of the Italian dishes, one of the sauces that everybody gets incorrect. And that, my friends, is going to be pesto. I have here a whole bunch of leftover basil leaves. And then I was like, okay, what do I want to do with these all these basil leaves? Um, and I was like, okay, you know what? Let's go ahead and make a really lovely, beautiful pesto. And so let's talk about this really quickly. Guys, we're going to be doing the pesto today in this thing, in my big, beautiful molcajete. Now, traditionally, in Italian cooking, you'd be doing a pesto in like a marble or like a granite uh, mortar and pestle. I don't have one of those. Instead, I simply just have one of these, and this is going to do just fine. But why is this important? Why am I using this big stone tool? I'm going to explain to you why, and I'm going to walk you through how to make the perfect pesto. Everybody, I'm going to tell you right now, most pesto sucks. The pesto that you have been eating, the pesto that you've been buying in jars, the pesto that you've been making yourself in a food processor, most of it sucks. Okay? And so, the reason why it sucks is because oftentimes the pesto that you are eating, the pesto that you are buying, the pesto that you're making is gritty. It's gritty and it's really separated and it has a bit of a greasy feel to it. My friends, look up a traditional pesto uh, Genovese. Look up a traditional Ligurian pesto. The creamy. They're really beautiful, they're really creamy, and we'll talk about why mortar and pestle is going to yield us uh, that delicious creamy texture and something like a food processor will not. Simply put, it has to do with emulsification, it has to do with gently breaking everything up, and it has to do with gently streaming in the olive oil. The goal, my friends, we're going to get this beautiful creamy pesto. And in order to achieve that, we have some lovely panoli, some lovely little pine nuts. Um, guys, pine nuts are incredibly expensive. Uh, you could substitute this theoretically with other kinds of nuts. In my opinion, the best thing to substitute this with is if you were to husk some sunflower seeds. Sunflower seeds, if you take the shell and the skin off of them, they're the things that taste the closest to pine nuts. So if you can't afford these, they're really expensive. This was like $8 for this little thing. Um, I probably shouldn't really be buying these that often. Also, Thainatos, do I like Turkish cuisine? I love Turkish cuisine. I grew up in a Turkish neighborhood, uh, and so there's a lot of really lovely Turkish restaurants near me. It's one of my favorite things to like whenever I have somebody visiting me. I love showing them some Turkish food. So guys, I have some pine nuts, and then I have some Parmesan. This isn't Parmigiano Reggiano, but this is just plain old American Parmesan. And so, we'll be building this really beautiful, this really delicious green pesto today, and with it, my friends, we will be doing a spätzle. A spätzle is a type of a German dumpling. I'm gonna be serving the pesto with a spätzle instead of a pasta. And the reason for this is because spätzle is the best way to get fresh boiled dough, fresh delicious like noodles at home. You just have to make a batter, you whisk it up, it's really really easy. We'll talk about why I want all of you to make spätzle. Is everybody listening? I want to hear a nice resounding yes chef, please. 
and thank you. I know my hair is overgrown. I'm gonna cut it one of these days, I promise. That day is not gonna be today. And so guys, in addition to the spätzle and pesto, we'll be doing a lovely shrimp corn tomato salad. I have some lovely corn here. We're gonna be charring it. I have some of these lovely tomatoes. We'll be salting it. I have some jalapenos in there for the spice. I have some red onions. I have some garlic. And I also have some lemons. So we're gonna make a lovely, delicious dressing, guys. It's going to be incredible. Three things to make today. Pesto, spätzle to be served with the pesto, and then a shrimp salad and I have shrimp currently sitting in my fridge just keeping that nice and cold so guys we have a lot that we need to get done today we got to make the pesto we got to make the spätzle batter and so we have a lot of prep ahead of us is everybody ready for today because I'm really excited about today's stream also Everybody, if you would like to help support The Cooking Show, if you would like to help support what we're doing here, if you'd like to help support the cause, please, please, please check out my Patreon. You can type an exclamation like Patreon or just scroll down and go into the About section. It would go a really, really long way. Um, my goal is to be able to do this full time one day. And so any and all support would be really appreciated. And so guys, uh, for today, as always, if you have any questions whatsoever, please feel free to ask me. I am here to teach you. That's right, I'm talking about you. I'm here to teach you how to cook. I'm here to teach you how to cook at home especially. Everything that I'm showing you today is super ideal for a home setting. A chopped salad that's perfect just to keep in the fridge. Spätzle, the best way to make fresh pasta, the best way to make fresh dough at home. It's gonna be incredible, it's gonna be delicious. And so, let's figure out what we need to make first. I think we should start getting some of the spätzle prep done and out of the way. Uh, or rather the pesto prep, excuse me. We're not gonna make the pesto immediately, we're just going to go ahead and get Get some of the ingredients together okay so as always i have a little cutting board all set up and all ready to go let's move a couple of things out of the way out of sight and out of mind so guys, of course, a lovely pesto begins with some fresh basil. Traditionally, you would use long, young Ligurian basil. I do not have access to young Ligurian basil. I just had this bunch of basil that I had left over sitting in my fridge. The only thing that we're really going to need to do to it is we're going to need to take off the leaves from the stems because the stems are going to compromise the total texture of the pesto itself. So guys, we're just going to go through one by one and pluck off every single one of the leaves. As you may tell, this isn't the world's best basil, right? It's a little brown on some parts of it. Some of it's a little flaccid. It's okay. This isn't peak basil season. We're still going to make something really, really delicious at the end of the day, okay? So all that I'm going to do is we're just going to go ahead and pluck every single little basil leaf off of the stems, and then we'll be discarding the rest of the stems. Does anybody have any questions about this process? Again, we, even though the stems do have a good amount of flavor, the reason why we do take them off is for the total, uh, the final texture, excuse me, of the pesto itself. And it's already super aromatic. It already smells really, really lovely. Okay? And just keep going. Just keep going all the way through. We gotta get all of these leaves, my friends. And again, ideally, you would be using young basil leaves because they're super, super tender, right? This middle stem that runs through them is a lot thinner. So the small basil leaves are ideal for something like this. If, of course, you don't have access to, you know, your own basil and only plucking off the young basil leaves, that is totally okay, my friends. Just do this with any kind of basil that you may have access to. Even if you have a Thai basil, if you were to have something like a Thai basil, I'm sure it would still be delicious. It would be unique. It wouldn't be traditional, but it would still be delicious at the end of the day. Um, basil is a fun beginner herb to grow. Pachirisu, I am sure. I would love to be able to grow my herbs one day. My own herbs, excuse me. Because guys, buying fresh basil isn't cheap at all. This amount of basil, I mean, I had a couple of other leaves, but basil was like $4 for me. Okay, so really, really not the cheapest herb by a long shot. Okay, so we're just going through everybody. We're plucking off every single leaf one by one. Does anybody have any questions thus far? It can be about this dish. It can be about something else. It can be about something else that we're doing later today. Also, if you would like to know everything else that we're doing, you can just type in exclamation mark menu. Basil is about 10 cents here. Kaze, where is here to you? This was a $4 bundle of basil. I am, I am so jealous. My taste all right grown indoors? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I would love to be able to grow my own basil. In the Middle East? Okay, I see. But yeah, this is this is a very like American thing that we have going on here with uh, you know, the actual like cost of food and certain produce. Especially because I guess it's not really the time of the year for basil yet, but four dollars is a significant amount. Did you like Madoka Magica? Jack, I have a lot of feelings on it, but I will say I did like it. It made me wish I were a magical girl. Okay guys, so we have all of this lovely basil ready to go. And I'm actually going to set a few of the big leaves 
okay? Like these really, really big leaves, because again, these are not the most tender ones. Uh, we're going to be setting these aside actually for my shrimp salad. So just these four leaves are gonna be going for the shrimp salad, and then the rest of this bad boy is going to go towards the pesto. Because guys, we're making a shrimp salad today. It's nice to have a really delicious fresh herb with it. You can do parsley, you can do cilantro, okay? You can do mint, you can do tarragon, but in this case, because I already have some basil, I'm just going to go ahead and save just a few of these bad boys for the salad. I will go ahead and just set that all behind me. And now let us continue on with the rest of the prep that we need to do. The next thing that we're going to need to do for the pesto, my friends, is we gotta go ahead and grab a couple of garlic cloves, or in my case, maybe just one, because as you guys may tell, these are some pretty massive garlic cloves. That is huge. I think, I think I'm only going to need one of these for the pesto today. So this I'm just going to go ahead and set aside, set that behind me. Okay, and then I'm gonna go ahead and grab a little plate. And all that we're going to do, my friends, is we're just going to go ahead, and we don't need the garlic press for this today, is because we're going to be using a mortar and pestle. We'll still be grinding all of it down. We're just going to go ahead and give this a little smash. And the reason why we do give it a little smash is so that the rest of the garlic skin can easily come off. Okay, and so everybody, let's talk about a little garlic misconception. This is something that you see all the time said in classic Italian cooking. I mean like homeland Italian cooking, in French cooking, in Spanish cooking. They say that the germ of the garlic, if you were to slice this down the middle, this little green part, that you have to take it out because it gives you heartburn. It is completely nonsense. It is 100% nonsense. Guys, more or less, the entirety of the garlic clove tastes identical. I have no idea where, at one point in Western European cooking, they decided that the center of a garlic clove is too pungent or too strong or it gives you heartburn. It is complete nonsense. This is the kind of a thing that is taught in European cooking schools. It's the kind of a thing in old European restaurants. It is absolutely nonsense. So it's not something that a lot of people still do and still practice, but it is something that you grandma might still practice, okay? And so yeah, if it's kind of brown, then get rid of it green, uh, green fang X, Y, Z. But if it's green, if it's sprouting, it's kind of just okay. So just one garlic clove is all we're going to need for today. And the next thing that we're going to need, my friends, is some of these lovely pine nuts. So let's talk about these pine nuts really quickly. So these pine nuts, if I'm not mistaken, are not actually nuts at all. Can somebody please fact check me on this before I give somebody with allergies the wrong information? Uh, these are pine nuts, my friends. They're really, really delicious. They're almost like a very sweet, creamy sunflower seed. Okay, and so we're going to need approximately a tablespoon and maybe like a little bit more. I'm not really gonna be too crazy about measuring it out, okay? Um, again, if you do not have access to pine nuts because some supermarkets don't always carry them, and let's be honest, these things are expensive. Pine nuts are incredibly expensive. This little container of pine nuts cost me $8. Okay, so if you do not want to use pine nuts, guys, I bet the best substitution, you can just literally taste it. It is so similar to a sunflower seed, okay? And people say that, oh, you can use walnuts, you can use all these other things. To me, this tastes like a sunflower seed. So get some sunflower seeds and give it a shot, okay? So that's what I would use for this. I'm going to go ahead and put it back away behind me really quickly. We're not going to need any more pine nuts for today. Okay, and then everybody, last but not least, super, super simple. Okay, also hi to you in the chest, welcome on in. Today's a special Tuesday stream because I was, uh, I'm gonna be missing a couple of streams. Yes, I am 100% okay, Tugina. We posted the schedule in the Discord. So guys, the last thing that we're going to need to go ahead and get prepped and out of the way is, of course, a bunch of Parmesan cheese. Pesto is this lovely, creamy, beautiful sauce with Parmesan, with pine nuts, with garlic, and of course, fresh basil, and then finished off with some olive oil. So I'm gonna go ahead and set these plates behind me. And we're going to go ahead and get my little block of Parmesan out. Everybody, again, traditionally, you would be using Parmigiano Reggiano. Parmigiano Reggiano is a regional designation. It is not the same as Parmesan. However, because of the fact that Parmigiano Reggiano is always imported from Italy, it is quite expensive to come by. It is two to three times as expensive as regular Parmesan is. And so, regular Parmesan, it's not necessarily worse. Okay? It's not necessarily worse, it is just a different product. Regular Parmesan, as opposed to Parmigiano Reggiano, is plastic aged, as opposed to wax aged, and it's also aged, excuse me, for a shorter period of time. So it has a lot less funk, okay? 
It has a lot less funk. It has a lot less of that like really, really sharp aged flavor. And so we're just going to need to use more of it. Uh, G Spent, you said, are the pine nuts toasted slash are we toasting them? These are untoasted pine nuts. So I'm going to tell you why I'm not toasting my pine nuts. Uh, Serious Eats did a bit of an article on pesto. They did a bit of a taste test and they concluded that toasting pine nuts is kind of overall, you know, not really a waste of time, but you can't really quite taste the difference. And so I don't personally think it's worth going through that effort. Okay, so we're going to need to go ahead and get a bunch of lovely fresh Parmesan. Okay. And so I have this here, and we're going to be doing this, of course, over the finest setting on your grater, or in my case, I'm gonna be using a microplane. I have no idea how much Parmesan I wanna use for this. I'm going to do a generous amount because this is, again, American Parmesan. This is not Parmigiano Reggiano. It's a lot more mild, and so to get the same salinity, to get the same oomph, to get the same funk, you're just going to need more of it. Can I please get a yes, chef? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and have a little sip of water. Mm. Green Fang, you said, I got some sheep's milk cheese and I think it was Parmesan or something that was that strong. You could absolutely use that. You could use theoretically any dry cheese for this. You could use uh, Pecorino Romano. Pecorino Romano would be an excellent choice for this. You could use a Grana Padano. I believe Grana Padano is the non-regional designation, as in it can be made anywhere in Italy, if I'm not mistaken. Somebody fact check me on that. Uh, of Parmesan. So you could do this a traditionally. You don't have to use Parmesan. You can use Grana Padano. You can use, uh, of course, Pecorino Romano for this. Okay. So let's go ahead and get a bunch of this Parmesan nicely shredded up. And guys, you know, we'll save, we'll save the pesto making um, because I think it's going to be like a nice show and I don't want it to do it immediately because we'll be doing it in a mortar and pestle. So we're going to go ahead and grate this up, grate it up, grate it up. And we're doing this again on the finest setting. We're not looking for big shreds. We need it to easily incorporate into the pesto that we're building. So keep going, keep going, keep going. Keep going, keep going, keep going. And again, I'm completely eyeballing this. This is not an exact ratio. You should not treat it as such. I'm not measuring anything, my friends. I'm not weighing anything out for this. All I'm doing is I'm just getting this given quantity of Parmesan, and then we're going to go ahead and scoop it up and put it into a bowl. So, little teeny tiny bowl, lovely. And now, let's just scoop this bad boy up. And you see these big chunks? Those are the only ones that we're going to want to go ahead and set aside. Or in my case, just inhale them and almost choke on them, okay? Let's get all of that Parmesan inside. Lovely. Okay, and just a few more. All of that inside of my lovely bowl because we don't want to waste any of this stuff. Okay, awesome. So. Everybody, once again, for the pesto today, we're going to need a whole bunch of fresh basil leaves. We have some pine nuts, a garlic clove, and a big, big, big bunch of Parmesan cheese. I am now going to go ahead and wrap up this existing Parmesan and throw that into my fridge. Okay, so guys, we gotta talk about pesto really quickly. We need to talk about the fact that this is the kind of a dish, this is the kind of a food that is just going to be better in a home setting, and let me talk about why. Herbs, fresh herbs, things like basil, things like parsley, things like cilantro, guys, they are volatile above all else. They're volatile. Once you start cutting them, once you start chopping them, they have a limited shelf life, okay? The more that you process, the more that you blend them, the more of the flavor that ends up leaving over time. When you buy jarred pesto, no matter how much money you're actually spending on it, it is always going to be less flavorful than the one that you make at home fresh. This is one of those things that is just ideal fresh, ideal homemade. Okay, so I'm just taking a second. I'm getting some cheese off of my cutting board. Getting that done, getting that out of here. Okay, and now guys, we're gonna be moving on to making the batter for the spätzle. And we'll talk about exactly what spätzle is, and we'll talk about why I'm making it, and why I'm a really, really huge fan of making spätzle at home. So I'm just quickly cleaning up my station putting a couple of things away, okay? And I'm gonna go ahead and get a nice large mixing bowl out. Wait a second, that's not a large mixing bowl. Did I get the wrong size? Mm. Okay, that's gonna be my large bowl, perfect. Okie dokie, and I think that will do just nicely for us. Actually, maybe I should do the other size. I have a glass bowl that I think would be a little bit easier to manage. Yeah, that should be good. Okie dokie. 
So guys, let us talk about what even spätzle is to begin with. Spätzle is a uh, is a German dumpling. Okay, and when I say a dumpling, I don't mean necessarily the uh, like stuffed dumplings, right? Not like a Chinese dumpling. I mean it as the uh, American dumpling. Think of something like chicken and dumplings. All that essentially is is a really really simple batter. Okay. It's a really, really simple batter, um, and you're going to be putting it through this really, really cool tool. This is a spätzle tool, my friends. It is essentially a glorified cheese grater. And you put the dough in here, you put the batter in here, and it cuts it for you. So let's talk about why we're even doing this to begin with in a home setting. Let me talk to you about something. Is everybody listening? I want to hear a nice yes, chef. Please and thank you. Let me tell you this. Making pasta dough at home is a novelty. Listen. The way that Italian households used to have fresh pasta at home all the time, do you know why? It's because there was a woman at home, there was a grandma at home, whose entire job was to take care of the house. She would take care of the house, she would clean, and then she would make all of the meals at home. The only reason pasta was able to be like a constant staple of the Italian household was when you had a dedicated role of somebody whose entire job was to cook in a home setting. If you work a regular job, you do not have the liberty to just make fresh pasta on a day-to-day -day basis. You can do it as a novelty, you can do it on the weekends, but making fresh pasta is a pain in the ass. It's fun, it can be enjoyable, but let me tell you something. You have to make the dough, you have to knead the dough, rest it, roll it out, you need a nice big flat surface, then you gotta wash the surface afterwards. It is a massive headache to do in a day-to-day -day basis if you're just at home. And so, my solution to that, my solution to be able to get beautiful fresh pasta, my solution to be able to get beautiful fresh dough, because guys, few things in life are as delicious as fresh dough, is to make spätzle. Okay, and the beauty of spätzle is there's no kneading, there's no rolling, there's no flat surfaces. All you need to do is make this delicious batter. And of course, it comes from, uh, this is a German tradition, right? This is a German food, but it is a blank slate. It is dough. You can flavor it, you can season it any which way you want. And so, I have a couple of bowls set up here. We are going to begin the process of making the spätzle dough, my friends. And so, it's going to start off with two cups of flour. So I'm going to go ahead and get that done and get that into the bowl. And a really, really nice thing about this, guys, okay, uh, is this is not an exact ratio. This is not the kind of a food that you need to have precise measurements for. It's a batter. It's a dough. It's not going to get leavened. It's not going to get baked. The beauty of this is in just how easy it is to throw together at home, okay? So... Here's the ratio that we need to keep in mind. Two cups of flour to three eggs to three quarters of a cup of milk. Really, really simple. Um, and again, we're just gonna be approximating all of it. I'm using a measuring cup, but I'm not gonna level it out. I'm not gonna do anything crazy like that, okay? So just, you know, that's like basically a cup of flour. And we're going to go ahead and add that inside. And we're going to do another cup of flour and just add that inside. Just like that, nice and easy. I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of this measuring cup now. Throw that into my dishwasher. Oof, I apologize for being a little bit sniffly today, guys. I am still recovering from being a little bit sick. Can we get a Metal Gear salute to all the women who took on the goal of always providing fresh pasta? Operator Gamma, I have never played Metal Gear, so I would not even know what that looks like. Okay, so I, I, uh, I apologize. I will not be able to do that for us. Okay, and so now, let's go ahead and season the dry ingredients. Everybody, we're gonna blend the milk and the egg separately, and then we'll be gently folding them inside, okay, until all of it just about comes together. But the reason why we mix up the dry ingredients separately is because that way we can make sure that the salt and the nutmeg that we're gonna be adding to this is evenly distributed throughout. If we were to add it, um, let's say like directly into the flour and not mix it in, we're gonna get little clumps of salt and little clumps of nutmeg. So. Let's go ahead and get that sorted now. Why are we using nutmeg? Well, pretty traditional to use in German cooking for uh, specifically a spätzle. We're gonna go very gentle, guys. Very, very light. So, microplane, a little bit of nutmeg. The nutmeg, again, it's not essential here, but just a little bit, I feel like would be really, really nice. A Little bit of nutmeg, and we can stop right there. I think that is going to be plenty of nutmeg for today. Let's tap it out. It's okay if we got some Parmesan in there, who cares? A Little bit of nutmeg, everybody. I'm gonna go ahead and put that away now. And now we are going to need a whisk and a generous amount of salt. Even if your pesto is going to be seasoned, I want my spätzle to also be seasoned, 
okay? Because a spätzle will otherwise just be these big dollops of bland, bland dough. So one big pinch of kosher salt, maybe even two generous pinches of kosher salt and three pinches of kosher salt are going to go inside. Okay, and last but not least, to fully finish off the seasoning for this, we're going to do a little bit of finely ground black pepper. So I'm tightening it, I'm tightening up as much as it'll go, and some black pepper just goes directly inside. And not too much, because I'm not looking for this to be too heavily seasoned. Okay, there you go, all of that in. And now everybody, let's whisk, 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 let's whisk all of this together. Let's whisk it, let's whisk it. And again, you want to make sure that all of that salt, that all of that nutmeg is evenly distributed. Can I please get a yes, chef? Please and thank you. Also, Tayton. Hello. Did you used to go by Thick Boy Tayton? Welcome on in. It's lovely to have you. Was that your old Twitch channel? I'm sorry just to put you on blast immediately like that. Okay, great. You see, I remember. Well, welcome on in. This is the best cooking show on Twitch. So guys, we're just distributing the nutmeg. We're distributing the salt. We want to make sure that it's not in any little pockets, that it's not in any clumps inside, okay? And this is also going to help get rid of some of the lumps inside of the flour itself. Make sure that you cannot over whisk at this stage, guys. You can absolutely over mix it when we add in the wet ingredients because then we could over develop the gluten and the batter could get too tough. But you cannot, and I repeat, you cannot over whisk it at this stage. So keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Make sure that it's all the way throughout. Tap it around, get it all inside, my friends. And then we're just going to go ahead and set that aside. And now let's go ahead and get the rest of the ingredients into this bowl. We're going to need three eggs and three quarters of a cup of milk. So let's go ahead and get that going now. I have exactly three eggs left. Oh my God, I thought, okay, that's, that's, that's kind of clutch. I thought I would have run out of eggs, but if we did, we could have just substituted in a little bit more milk. So three eggs, just gonna get that ready to go. I should have probably taken that out sooner. Three eggs, and we're going to need in total three quarters of a cup of milk. So let's go ahead and get that inside. And again, this is not going to be an exact ratio. You are going to be adjusting the consistency of the batter based on the final texture. I'm going to show you what the texture needs to look like, but then you can just adjust and play around with the moisture, especially because depending on the size of your eggs, guys, you might get a completely different consistency than me. So I'm going to first add in each of my eggs, okay? I'm going to move the flour aside. I'm going to move it to the side. And I have each of my eggs. Guys, I like to break my eggs on a nice flat surface so that we don't push any of the eggshells in or anything. Okay, so nice flat surface, big, big generous hit. And we do the eggs first so that we can easily pick out any eggshells. If we added the milk in first, right, and we accidentally got an eggshell inside, it'd be really, really difficult to actually see that. So that's two, and we'll wipe that off, don't you worry. That's two eggs. And last but not least, let's go ahead and get number three in. And number three, get that all inside. Lovely. I'm just gonna go quickly rinse off my hands of all of those egg whites. Get them off of me, get them out of here. Can you tell them it's fine, chef? Yeah, absolutely. Jack, I encourage people to ask questions. Everybody, please, if you have any cooking questions whatsoever, my goal is to get you excited about cooking at home. My goal is to get you all a little bit more competent at cooking at home, okay? So any and all questions will be always, always appreciated. So I'm just gonna go ahead and wipe this off really quickly before it dries on or anything, okay? And guys, we're going to now need three quarters of a cup of milk. Uh, and the actual amount will be a little bit variable. Um, so again, some days you're going to need half a cup, some days you're gonna need a full cup. Just play around with it. It's not going to be exact. This is a batter, this is home cooking. We're not weighing out the ingredients, we're not doing anything crazy, we're keeping it really, really simple. So, half a cup of lovely whole milk, because there is no point to skim milk, there's no point to 2%, okay? Whole milk is where it's at, and that should be the total three quarters, and I'm gonna have a little sip. Mm. I love milk so much. I love it. I cannot live without it. Okay, dokie. I'm going to go ahead and throw this into the dishwasher now, as we have no more use for it. Okay, lovely. No cookies this time, Taza. Just, just milk today. Oh. Okay. 
Um, chef, you recently made a bread roll type product that requires no kneading. So, uh, Motor Bike Dan, that was a two ingredient drop biscuit. That was a cream drop biscuit. So all we did was an equal weight of cream to uh, self rising flour. Okay, so everybody, a little bit of egg, some milk in here, and all we're going to do, we're going to first break it up. And so, let's talk about fluid dynamics for a second. Let's talk about the most efficient way to break this up. Some people say, oh, you need to make it all fluffy by whisking it like this, and you make little circles. Nonsense. We do not need any air incorporated inside of this. All that we need to do is just to fully incorporate this. The best method to fully incorporate this is not circles, is not figure eights, guys. It is so simple. It is side to side. This was something tested by the America's Test Kitchen quite some time ago. I tried it out for myself. And side to side, quite literally like this, just side to side, is the fastest way to get this incorporated. You could do all of this, but it's really, really inefficient, relatively speaking. All we need to do is side to side. Now, if your goal is to make a mayonnaise, you're looking to do a figure eight shape because that way you need to whisk in some air. In this case, we just need to incorporate it, my friends. So just whisk, 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 whisk until we have no streaks of egg white. Ready? And it's almost done. That is how little whisking it needs if you do a proper side to side motion. There is no messing around with a fork, right? And again, I don't know the specific reasons for this. And oh, I talked, I said, oh, we're gonna talk about fluid dynamics for a second. I actually don't know the specific reason why this is faster, but this is just significantly faster. Significantly faster, significantly easier. And all we're looking to do, no streaks of egg white, no streaks of egg yolk. I think that that is all ready to go. And so, that's all ready to go. I will put away Mr. Whisk. Everybody, please say thank you to Mr. Whisk. I need everybody in chat to say that, please, and thank you. We're going to go ahead and grab a handy dandy little silicone spatula. Silicone spatula just so that we can easily get into the sides of everything. Okay, and we're going to pour this in. We're gonna do about half at a time, half at once. We're going to just try hydrating this dough really quickly. And it's not a dough, excuse me. It's just gonna be a really, really simple batter, my friends. That is why this is so, so ideal in a home setting, okay? So all of that goes in and then the next batch all inside, eh, let's just do it all at once. We don't have to incorporate it slowly. The only thing that we need to stop from happening is we don't wanna over mix this. Also, that's not enough people saying thank you, Mr. Whisk. So let's try that again, please and thank you. We're looking for a thick batter, something almost pancake-like. It's okay if there's some slight clumps in there. You don't have to worry about there being too many clumps, guys. Okay, so we'll just keep mixing until all of this just comes together. Just keep mixing, keep mixing, okay? Keep mixing, keep mixing, keep mixing. And again, be gentle. We're not looking to overmix this. If you overmix this, it's going to be too chewy. It's going to be too tough. It's not going to pass through um, your spätzle tool. Okay, it's getting there. It's getting there. So a little bit more, a little bit more. And again, this is too lumpy for me. Um, we don't need that many lumps. We don't need an aggressive amount of lumps. Um, okay, chef, is there a difference between whisking the dry ingredients and just sifting them into the bowl? So the reason we whisk the dry ingredients uh, isn't to actually get rid of the little clumps of flour. It's so that we can evenly distribute the salt. In this case, we did not need to whisk, or, or, uh, excuse me, we didn't need to strain the flour. You would only do that for like really delicate pastries. Okay, so that's why we don't use a flour sifter for this. Flour sifters are not to evenly incorporate things, it's to get rid of any humidity clumps inside of the flour itself. So, almost done everybody. Again, just keep going. We still have a few too many lumps for my taste. Just keep going, keep going, keep going. Okay, and then soon enough, we'll call it a day. We will have a lovely spätzle batter. Do you see how easy that was to come together? Do you see how quickly all of that just came together? That is the beauty of doing a spätzle, guys. There is no kneading. There is no rolling. This is the hardest part of the job. I'm switching to a wooden spoon because it's a little bit more robust. Okay, so I don't have to use as many of my control muscles and actually being able to effectively mix all of this together. And this looks like the final texture that I'm looking for. Okay, so you see it's clinging to the spoon. It has a little bit of give, okay? But it's not super, super dry. It doesn't look like a ball of dough or anything. We're just really looking for a pancake batter sort of consistency. Okay, I might have too many clumps in here, but I think it'll be okay. Just maybe a little bit more mixing. A little bit more, and then we'll call it a day. Yeah, 
I think that should be quite all right. And so everybody, the last step that we're going to need for it is we're just going to need to go ahead and cover him up with some plastic wrap and let it sit. And the reason why we need to let it sit is because we need to ensure that all of the flour evenly hydrates. Okay, so this is a general rule of thumb anytime you're working with wet batters or any kinds of doughs whatsoever, and you have a lot of wet ingredients, you need to let it hydrate. Okay, so let's go ahead and wrap this bad boy up in a little bit of plastic wrap. And then guys, we will be making the pesto. It'll be really, really fun. It'll be really delicious. Oh, I'm really excited about that. Okay, and we're gonna keep it nice and airtight. Again, this is so that we don't dry out the dough or anything. We don't dry out the, pe uh, the spätzle batter. Okay, and I'll just be setting him behind me. Excuse she, Jesus to you. Now that's, that's, that's terrible. That's a, I've never heard somebody say that out loud before. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and just put my spätzle batter behind me again. Everybody, you wanna let this sit for about 20 minutes or so before we actually get to the boiling stage of it all. Today's gonna be a fairly short stream, I think. We don't really have that much to do today. Um, I think the spätzle making is gonna be the last thing that we do and then we'll just serve everything up. I'm going to go ahead and take a quick little second to just clean up as I go. Everybody, clean as you go in a home setting. You wanna make sure that you have a nice empty dishwasher. Nice empty dishwasher, nice empty sink before you begin cooking, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of both of my tools here. Just quickly wash them under some water because they have all of this battery stuck to them, of course. And I'll be throwing all of that into the dishwasher. I'll be moving on to the actual pesto making itself, which I'm really excited about. Is everybody ready for that? I wanna hear a nice resounding yes chef, please and thank you. Just throw that inside. Awesome. Let's throw this inside. Very cool. Okay. Everybody, it is time for us to make a lovely, a lovely, beautiful homemade pesto. This is it. This is kind of the moment that we've all been waiting for. Okay, make it a long stream, Robert Bob. I don't think I have enough stuff to do today to actually properly make it a long stream. So let's head back here. And now guys, this is the trick. This is the key to a real, proper, authentic mortar and pestle, uh, to a pesto, excuse me, which is a mortar and pestle. In my case, I am using a Mexican molcajete. Okay, this isn't exactly the traditional one that would be used in Italian cooking. This is the one that you would see, uh, of course, in Mexican cooking. It's just really, really coarse, but overall it's going to be the same thing. So everybody, why are we using this tool today? Why am I using this instead of a food processor, you might be asking me. And the reason we do this is because a pestle, a mortar and pestle, it grinds ingredients instead of aggressively chopping them up. Excuse me, by grinding them, we're able to not overprocess the basil, we're able to get a really beautiful fine consistency on the uh, pine nuts, and we're able to slowly drizzle in olive oil. Your pestos in a food processor will always suck. I'm gonna say this right now and I'm gonna say it again and again. Your pestos inside of a food processor will always suck, everybody. It is because they don't properly grind all of the ingredients down. It's because they don't properly grind down the basil. It becomes oily and separated. Guys, a pesto is not supposed to be an oily, messy sauce. A beautiful pesto is supposed to be creamy. It's gonna be this bright, vibrant, green, creamy sauce, okay? And it's going to begin with the first step, which is going to be grinding down some pine nuts. So let's get all of my ingredients out. Let's get all of my ingredients ready to go. And so, Robert Bob, pine nuts are expensive. Um, you can use sunflower seeds instead of pine nuts because I tasted a pine nut and it tastes so similar to a sunflower seed. Okay, so that would be my recommended substitution. You could probably do like a mixture of pine nuts and something else to get something really close. Okay, so guys, all of my pine nuts are just going to go directly inside Okay, and this is not for bashing. A wooden mortar and pestle, let's say like a Thai one or a Dominican one, those are meant for pounding. This stone one is not meant for pounding. What a stone one does well is grind, my friends. And that is exactly what we're going to do today. We're essentially going to make this little pine nut butter inside. 
We're going to take all of my pine nuts and we're going to grind them down. We're going to grind them down and grind them down. And having a nice big mortar and pestle, you want to use a stone one for this. Okay, again, traditionally, a granite or a marble one, but in my case, I have a lovely Mexican mortar and pestle here. Okay, so we're just going through all of this, we're going through all of it, and we're just making this really, really nice pine nut butter at the bottom. Grinding it down, and the goal, guys, the goal of a pesto isn't for it to be gritty. You're not supposed to get massive chunks of pine nut inside. Okay, and that is one of the things that a food processor does not do well. It chops it up, but it doesn't actually give you the consistency of the pine nuts that you're really looking for. This is what we're looking for, guys. Okay, so we're grinding it. We're using the full length, the full surface area. And we're grinding it and grinding it, okay? Grinding all of it down. There you go. That is exactly what it should look like at this stage, everybody. We're using the friction. We're using the abrasion. We're using the sides. We're using the surface area of my mortar and pestle here. Okay? And we're breaking it down, breaking it down. Okay? There you go. Nice and fluffy. Nice and soft. Beautiful. Okay. There you go. Beautiful. Okay, and now that that stage has been completed, guys, we will now add in the garlic and also properly process it down. We don't want any chunks of garlic. We just want to go ahead and mash it up. And we're going to add in a little bit of extra salt just for some abrasion while we're doing this process, okay? So a little bit of salt goes in. And then we'll be seasoning this incrementally as well. We'll be adding that in. And now, guys, let's go ahead and just process and let's process and let's grind Mr. Garlic all the way down until we have this lovely paste of pine nuts and garlic. Keep grinding, keep grinding, keep grinding, keep going. It's gonna be a bit of a process. It's going to take a little bit of time, but at the end, my friends, we will be rewarded with a lovely pesto. And you can already see it start to come to life now. There you go. That's what we're looking for. Whew. It's already beginning to come to life a little bit, but once we start adding in the basil, that's when it really, really, truly transforms into a lovely pesto. Whew. Okay, and let's go in. Let's keep grinding all of this up. Let's keep grinding. Let's keep grinding. Oh, and it already smells lovely, everybody. It smells like garlic. It smells like the fresh pine nuts as well. So simple, so easy. It just takes a little bit of elbow grease, okay? We're going to keep going. We're going to keep grinding until we have no big chunks of garlic, everybody. Again, we don't want chunks of garlic. This is supposed to essentially be a cream, okay? So we have to keep grinding. We have to keep grinding. We have to keep going, keep going, keep going, okay? And we're almost there. We're almost done with this first step. And then we'll be going in with all of our lovely basil. Keep going, keep going, keep it grinding, keep it processing. All of it has to get ground up, everybody. Okay, and then every now and then we'll just take like a little teaspoon. And with a little teaspoon, we'll just be scraping off everything that could be stuck potentially to my pestle. I don't know why I pronounce it so hard. It's just pestle, not pestle. Okay, there you go. And we're almost done with the step, everybody. Let's just make sure that we're not wasting everything, that we're getting everything just back on into the bowl. There you go. Keep it grinding. Almost done. Almost done. Almost done. Okay. A um, couple more. Let's just keep going. We still have a couple of chunks of garlic that I would like to process. Actually, I think it's good for some basil. I think now it may be ready for a little bit of basil action. So, everybody, this is our base. We got a little bit of pine nut in here. We have a little bit of the garlic. And now, the trick is to add in the basil leaves incrementally, everybody. If you add in too big of a clump at once, if you add it in all at once, it becomes so much more difficult to target all of your basil leaves. So, molcajete versus mortar and pestle for this. So, uh, Stacey, it's a really good question. I'm using my molcajete. 
I think this would actually just really help with the abrasion overall. I think, I don't know if it would make that significant of a difference. If anything, I think a molcajete would be able to do this process just a little bit easier, if anything else. Okay, and it's getting really, really sticky, guys. It's getting really, really thick at the bottom. Okay, let's just keep going. Let's keep grinding. Let's keep breaking down all of my lovely fresh basil. And now the aroma of the basil is beginning to form. This is the beginning of a lovely pesto, but we are not anywhere close to being done quite yet. We have to get this basil broken down. We have to get it ground up beautifully. Okay, all of it inside, lovely. Keep grinding, keep it going, keep it processing. Keep it processing, keep it processing, keep it processing until we start to form that lovely green paste. There you go. That's what I'm talking about, everybody. And I know it doesn't look like much right now. And I know this doesn't look like it's going to yield a lot. Also, keep in mind that my mortar and pestle is really, really massive. My molcajete is huge. Does anybody have any questions about this process so far? We're just grinding the basil, we're grinding the basil, we're grinding him down, and we're getting this really, really lovely pureed basil. That's it, that's what I'm talking about. Awesome, okay, Whew. it's getting a little bit hot in here. I thought I set my AC to 66 and it's still hot, so I'm gonna need to up that fan speed ASAP. Okay, so let's keep it going. Let's keep it going. We've got to keep processing down all of this stuff, guys. Okay? And now I think we will be ready for the next little addition. Okay? And I know it looks like it's lost a lot of volume, but I promise you it's all going to get there. It's all going to come together in the form of a beautiful pesto. Okay? So that goes in alongside, of course, another little tiny pinch of salt. And again, we're adding in the salt just to really, really help with the abrasion of it all just to really help continue to break it down. We don't want too much salt because remember the Parmesan itself is gonna be really, really salty. So add that in and break it all down, my friends. Break it down, break it down, break it down. Oh. There you go. And guys, do you hear that sound? Do you hear that sticky sound? I want you all to pay attention. That is the sound that you want to hear. It's going to turn nice and bright green as it's taking in some air. That is the sound of a proper pesto. A pesto is not supposed to be a runny, liquidy, greasy sauce. I'm going to say this again and again as many times as it takes. A pesto is not supposed to be a runny, greasy, liquidy sauce, guys. Okay? This is how you make a proper, beautiful pesto. You break it down slowly. And another added benefit, when you have a food processor, when you have a motor, it makes it so hot that you're actively sometimes cooking the basil to actually get the ideal texture. The beauty of a mortar and pestle, guys, is that it doesn't heat things up nearly as intensely as a blender or a food processor. Also, Pizza Face, thank you so much for stopping by. So if mortar and pestle, in a way, while it deals with little hard bits so much better because of the fact that it grinds it down, we're also making sure to maintain the temperature a lot better. Okay, so take a look. Guys, look at it. It's beginning to form and it still doesn't have the olive oil and it still doesn't have the cheese, but it already looks so, so, so delicious. Are you all excited about this pesto? I wanna hear a nice yes chef, please and thank you. So a few more leaves going right inside with, you guessed it, a little teeny tiny sprinkling of salt. And I do mean a tiny sprinkle of salt because again, this is not that much volume in here and we really don't wanna over salt this. There you go. That's grinding down. That is now becoming a lovely, beautiful pesto, my friends. There you go. Give this a little rotation and just keep it going, keep it going until that cream continues to form. Also, Operator Emma, that's exciting. I'm very happy for you. Oof, it is hot in here. Wow. Chef, what if taking, instead of taking my own time to make the pesto, what if I made my own pasta? Well, G-Spent Gaming, let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. You could do that. However, I think, personally, 
A store-bought, uh, like, dried pasta will always be delicious. Fresh pasta is not necessarily better or worse than dried pasta. They're just different tastes and different textures. This is something that is objectively better than any store-bought version. A homemade pesto will always be better than store-bought because of the fact that it is fresher. Guys, look at the cream. Look at the cream. This is what it means to make a mortar and pestle pesto. A blender can't do this kind of a cream, guys. Look at it. Look at the cream beginning to form. That's what I'm talking about. That is the beauty of a mortar and pestle pesto. Of a mocha hete pesto. We're grinding down each and every single one of these leaves, my friends, and we are making something truly, truly beautifully delicious out of it. Okay? So let's go ahead. Guys, I'm so excited about this. I'm so excited about this. It is continuing to form. We're in the final stages. We are in the final stages, I repeat. Okay? So, let's go in now. We have not, we're have we gonna do two more batches of basil in total. We're doing this gradually, we're doing this incrementally. Okay? Two more batches, this is the second one, and then we're gonna have one more after. All of it inside, I'm not gonna add in more salt until the end, guys. Guys, look how creamy it sounds. Listen to that noise. That is exactly what it should sound like. You hear that sound? Everybody, just shush for a second. I'm gonna, even I'm gonna shut up, okay? Listen. That is what a pesto should sound like. That is the beauty of using a mortar and pestle, and I know it's more effort. I know it's more, um, you know, time this way. But listen and see the difference in the sheer quality of the product that you and I are obtaining together. Guys, how many times have you seen a pesto that's like dark green and it's like covered in oil with little bits of pine nuts? That is not what it's supposed to look like. That is not what a pesto is supposed to look like at all, my friends. This, on the other hand, this bright and green and nice and creamy, that is exactly what a pesto should be. Okay? So, everybody, that is the rest of my basil all going inside. All of it going in, all of it going in. Lovely. And let's get the last of this bad boy nice and processed. Listen to this. Listen to this. Listen to it. And it's going. And it's going, and it's going, and it's going. And it's getting there, and it's getting done. Beautiful. Hi, Dosky. It's lovely to have you. Welcome on in, my friend. That is what a pesto should look like, guys. Look at that. Beautiful. It's not going to need that much more processing, only a little bit more. I'm just continuing to clean off my pestle as I'm going. And I'm just making sure that I have no big, super fibrous chunks of leaves left over quite yet. Okay. And that looks pretty good, I think. Oof. Look at that, my friends. That is beginning to get through. That is fresh and it's aromatic and you can smell the basil, but it's still not quite done yet, guys, because now we have to go in with the cheese, of course. And I'm only going to do these two little handfuls of cheese. Okay, so the cheese, we can feel free to mix in aggressively as well. And guys, it's gonna get really, really thick. This is what's going to really, really help thicken up the pesto, but then this is still not done because the last step is going to be to slowly, slowly drizzle in the olive oil and build a beautiful emulsion. Jack, I don't think I want more cheese because I want this to be really subtle. I want this to be really delicate. The rest of the Parmesan, I think I'll just finish the pasta with. Maybe a little sprinkle of cheese more, okay? But I think for now, that should be good. Okay, guys, this is going to be the most tricky step coming on up. I have never made a pesto before, but even I know this. I've done a lot of research, right? I've taken a lot of inspiration from especially Italia Squista's um, Esquisita. I think that's how you say it. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, the pesto Genovese, okay? So guys, take a look. Look at that beautiful, creamy pesto, but it is still not done yet, everybody. Now it is time for the most critical stage. This is where pesto masters are formed and pesto losers are also subsequently created, okay? And this is gonna be the olive oil stage. The easiest way that you can mess up now, everybody, is to add in too much olive oil too quickly all at once. Okay, by adding in too much olive oil too quickly all at once, we are going to end up breaking the emulsion. We're going to end up breaking this beautiful cream that we ended up building together, okay? Let me just have a little taste. Mm. 
Guys, as it is, oh, that flavor is absurd by itself and it still doesn't have the olive oil. That is so, so delicious. So everybody, this is the key. This is the trick. I need to hear a nice yes chef. I need to make sure that all of you are watching, that all of you are listening. We're whisking it in slowly. We're mixing it in slowly, excuse me, with the uh, rest of the pesto. So make sure that your moiru and pestle can be standalone by itself like this. And we are gonna be just trickling it in. Trickle, trickle, trickle. And then we mix it in, guys. And then we mix it, mix it, mix it, mix it. And we mix it aggressively, okay? Because we're not looking to break this lovely emulsion that we built. We're not looking to destroy it. And now we're going to go in, go in, go in, go in. All the way around, all the way around. Oh, and add it in. We're mixing it in slowly, my friends. Little bit by little bit. In total, you know, you can use as much olive oil for something like this as you would like. And another thing, by the way, a blender or a food processor, they can end up making your olive oil bitter. I forgot the exact scientific reasoning behind it, but, um, you know, there's something about like the bitter compounds and breaking the actual emulsion of the olive oil and over mixing it, especially in a machine setting, can really, really easily yield a bitter oil. Mm. Oh, guys, that is outrageously good. That is outrageous. Also, that one frat guy, welcome on in. We already made the spätzle batter, okay? So, let's go in, let's go in, let's go in. Little bit, my friend, little, little tiny drizzles. That's it. That's the kind of drizzle I'm talking about. Dropping it in, dropping it in, dropping it in. There you go. That's it. That's how slowly we need to go, guys, for this beautiful, beautiful pesto. Look at the scream. Look at the sound. Listen to the sound, everybody. Sticky. That is exactly what I'm looking for out of this. Sticky and perfect and green and creamy. That is what I'm talking about. Mm. That is so good already. That is so good. I don't actually know how much olive oil I want to use. The olive oil, the actual final consistency, it is entirely up to you. It is entirely up to you and your own preferences of the taste and texture that you would like out of this. But I think I'm going to just stream in some more. But guys, look at it. Look at this pesto. Look how green it is. Look how vibrant it is. Look how creamy it is. That is why we do it this way. That is why we put in so much effort. Okay, can I please get a yes chef? I wanna make sure that all of you understand. Okay, we added in that olive oil and now once again, we're mixing it up, mixing it up. Whew, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort. Waking up a big sweat here, everybody but it's all going to be ultimately worth it. There you go. Oh, let's have a little bit of a taste of it now. Guys, come on, come on. You have to be kidding. That is so good. Um, there's gonna be no pasta water in this g spent. We just added in towards the end. Oh. Because the goal of the pesto is for it to just take in some of the pasta water and then it'll just kind of do its own thing. So you don't have to worry too much about that. Okay, everybody, last a little bit, last a little bit, I promise. And trickle it in. And trickle, 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 trickle. Come on, buddy, out you go. Thank you. Oof. My list is tired too. I haven't done this in a while. I haven't done this in quite some time, but look at what we get. Look at that pesto. Have you guys seen such a beautiful pesto? Does this look like the kind of a pesto that is sold to you in jars? You haven't had this kind of pesto even in some of the best Italian restaurants that you've been to because they don't do it this way. Even if they say they do homemade pesto, they probably do it in a food processor. This is not what their pesto looks like. This, however, is what mine looks like. Beautifully emulsified, nice and creamy, nice and vibrant. Last little bit of addition of olive oil, I think, and that will do for you today. And a little bit, little bit, little bit. Come on, buddy, let's go. Yeah. And a little bit more over here. We're not splitting it, we're being so gentle. So, so, so gentle. Oh, okay. When I said being so gentle, I added in a massive glug all at once. So let's salvage it. Let's mix it up really fast. 
but I think that should now be a sufficient quality, quantity, excuse me, of olive oil for today. Let's mix it in, let's mix it in. I'm gonna call that done. Oh, no more olive oil, let's just finish mixing and mixing and mixing all of it in. There you go, my friends. That is what a pesto should look like. That is not greasy. That is not gritty. That is not oily. That is a beautifully emulsified, beautifully vibrant, light green cream. So let's go ahead and just transfer that over to a little teeny tiny container. And I know this doesn't look like a lot of pesto, but guys, it is intense. Pesto is meant to be intense. It's meant to be really, really concentrated, okay? So you don't get a lot of volume yield, but you do get some of this gorgeous pesto, guys. This right here, this is what pesto should look like. That is my homemade pesto. I wasn't kidding around with it. I knew exactly what I was setting out when I was ready to make it. Okay? This is serious business, guys. Pesto is not a joke. It should not be regarded as such. So many people, they just throw all of their ingredients into the food processor, they blend it up, they overheat their basil, they destroy the taste of it subsequently, they don't properly emulsify it, and it becomes a greasy, oily, oily mess. But this, this is going to give us a delicious seasoned spätzle. Look at that, look at that pesto, guys. Look at this pesto. Right? It is creamy, it is fluffy, it is light, and we want to get every last drop of it out of this mortar and pestle. One of the only challenges of mortar and pestle is actually getting things out of it because of how much like surface area it has, everything just sort of sticks to the edges of it all, and it can be a bit of a headache sometimes. But we will make do, everybody. Let's do each one of these one by one. Okay, get that all out of here, and let's just continue with all of this. all of that inside. Guys, look at this pesto. It is concentrated. It is full of cheese. It is full of olive oil. It is full of the freshest of basil. Okay? So, all of it, all of it. Let's scoop all of it up. Let's scoop. Let's not waste any little bit of it. And guys, in fact, I might even clean up whatever is left inside of the mortar and pestle itself with like a little bit of bread or something. I think that would be nice. Chat, do we get a little treat? Do I get a little bit of bread to just have this? I need a little spatula. The issue with a little spatula for something like this is that it would grind it down. However, I do have a wooden tool that I could use for this. I do have a little wooden uh, spatula that I think would be all right for such a task. Let's just go ahead and gently, without pressing it too hard against the sides, just scoop it up. Yeah, I think that should do. So you know what? Maybe your suggestion of a spatula did end up helping me out anyways. It is just so, so sticky. So it's kind of difficult to scoop it all out. Okay. Almost done, everybody. Again, I just do not want to end up wasting any of this deliciousness. We worked so hard in making it, so we should get every last drop of it out. Okay, and we're almost done, guys. Okay. And I think that should do just fine. There you go. Okay. Good night, Patrice. Thank you so much for stopping by today. Okay. And let's just get the rest of this off of this bad boy. Because this is all still a considerable, considerable amount of pesto that we all have left over. And I think that should be good now. I don't think we wasted anything. So guys, we did not. Mm. Oh my God. Oh my God. Hi, side cheese, man. Welcome on in. Long time no see. Guys, this pesto, that is literally perfect. That is so good. 
That is incredible. Now, because we're not gonna eat this immediately, to stop it from immediately oxidizing, we are going to put a little bit of olive oil on top of it, not mix it inside, but just on top, okay? Just a little bit of olive oil all the way around. And that's just going to protect it from turning too brown or anything. Okay, and just move it around. Oh, guys, that was good. That is so delicious. I'm really, really impressed with myself for this. That came out even better than I thought it would. So, my homemade pesto, everybody. We're gonna go ahead and set that aside behind us. We are not going to need it for a while. Similarly, I'm going to go ahead and just put away my mortar and pestle because we're not going to need that either anymore today. I'm going to throw a couple of things into the dishwasher. Mm. Guys, this pesto, that is, hands down, one of the best pestos I've ever had. Mm. It's creamy, it's punchy from the garlic, it's cheesy. That is everything you want it to be and more. That is genuinely everything, guys. Okay, I'm gonna put all of that behind me, I'm gonna put all of that aside, just get my dishwasher nice and full. Okay, oh, lovely. Okay, guys, so what have we accomplished so far today? We made the batter for the spätzle. We have the batter just chilling out. It is currently resting. We're hydrating the flour. Uh, we have made the pesto for the spätzle. We made it by hand. We made it in a mortar and pestle, and we obtained this lovely pesto cream with fresh Parmesan, guys, with fresh basil leaves. It is absolutely incredible. So what else do we have left to do? We have to make the shrimp salad for today. I wanted to do a nice proteiny, nice shrimp salad full of vegetables, full of tomatoes, full of some nice charred corn. So guys, I think that we should get that going. Is everybody ready? I wanna hear a nice resounding yes chef, please and thank you from everybody watching. And as always, if you have any questions whatsoever, please feel free to ask me. If you'd like to support The Cooking Show, if you'd like to support what we do here, uh, please type in exclamation mark Patreon. Um, my goal is to be able to do this full time one day. And so uh, any support to the Patreon is a very nice way of directly supporting me. So my cutting board seems to be all ready to go. Everybody, we have some lovely tomatoes. So let's talk about this. What is the number one problem with tomatoes in a salad? They are wet, they're sopping wet. They have so much moisture inside of them, okay, that uh, what happens is they tend to make salads really soggy. Also, Jack, thank you so much for stopping by. Hope you feel better sometime soon. So what do we do with them? We take advantage of salt. We take the tomatoes, we slice them in half, and we salt them in advance by letting the humble tomato sit with a bunch of salt. What we get to do is we get to extract the excess moisture from them, Okay, we extract the excess moisture and the tomato gets to be fully seasoned all the way throughout. Otherwise, if you were to add these tomatoes as is inside of a salad, you're going to get a soggy salad. Okay, so I'm gonna grab every single one of my tomatoes here and go with whatever tomato uh, you wanna go with. For salads, I like cherry tomatoes, I like grape tomatoes, uh, things like these, okay? So just take them and put them all into my cutting board. Please stop running away, I am begging you. And then I'll put my uh, jalapenos and my corn behind me, out of sight and out of mind. Let's go ahead and take a little paring knife. Everybody, we want to slice these to the size that you want to actually have them in the salad. Let me tell you one of my biggest pet peeves. Is everybody listening? I hate getting cherry tomatoes whole inside of a salad. When you get a whole cherry tomato, when you get a whole grape tomato inside of a salad, guys, trying to stab it with a fork, you're eating a salad, you're eating a salad and you're like, hmm, Today I would like a tomato. I would like to bite into this tomato. And you try to go at it, and it slips away. You try to go at it, and it slips away. Who is supposed to enjoy that experience? It doesn't even look nice. It is not functional in the slightest. Everybody, the number one important thing when you're making food is you need to think about the function. My goal is to get the salad evenly combined with other ingredients, and so I want to get it also easily into your mouth. So my goal is to just take each of my cherry tomatoes with a nice sharp knife, and I'm just gonna be cutting them into quarters, or maybe halves. How am I feeling for today? I think quarters, because these are pretty big. Mm. These are pretty big tomatoes. So all the way through, all the way through, and let's just cut all of these bad boys up. I cannot stand 
whole tomatoes inside of a salad. It's a waste of time, it's difficult to eat, it slips away, and you can't even get any dressing on it because the skin is so smooth that the dressing slips off of it. There is no reason anybody should be putting a whole tomato inside of a salad. Does anybody have any questions? So I love chopped salads. I love chopped salads. I hate it when people make things rustic just for the sake of it. This started it off as just like a lazy restaurant thing. Lazy restaurant thing, they give you a couple of iceberg lettuce leaves. They give you like two cucumber slices. They give you like one cherry tomato and they call it a salad. That is not the kind of a salad that I want to be eating at home. Also, Gabupa, that's very sweet of you. Yeah, I got some more basil going. You can't have too much basil. So, one by one, nice and patiently, we will eventually end up slicing up all of these little bad boys, get them all done, get them out of here, get them under control. Okay. So today's a lot of prep. Today's not like a lot of cooking. We have like no sauteing to really do. Today we're keeping it all really, really simple. Okay. And even more. Lovely. Last three tomatoes to go. And guys, we are going to pre-salt them. We're going to salt them. We're going to let them sit in salt. And we're going to get all of that excess moisture off of them. So that a salad does not end up becoming soggy. And this one, nice little snack. Okay. And I'm going to grab a nice large bowl for them. Something large enough to be able to accommodate all of them. Okay, and let's just get all of them scooped up and inside of the bowl. Okay, I'm just gonna quickly uh, wash off like all of that tomato acid, get it all off of my hands, all of it off my paws, because I have no use for it. Okay. So, that has now been done. We now got that out of the way. Everybody, it is time for us to thoroughly, of course, salt the tomatoes. This is an essential, essential step. I love doing this for any kind of salad, okay? Remember, a tomato full of water. If you were to serve a salad immediately, you don't really have to worry about this. But my goal for my salads is, I wanna have something that I can have in my fridge for several days at a time. That's what it means to cook at home. To cook at home is to prepare food that will last you a few days, not just to eat things made for immediate consumption. So, the goal, we need to over-season this with salt because a lot of the salt is going to get lost in the moisture of the tomato. Over-season it with some salt, and now we're just going to gently, and I mean gently, lift up each tomato. We're not squishing it. We're not crushing it. We're not destroying the tomato. We're just lifting it up and moving it around. And you can already see how much it's bleeding. You can already see how wet it's becoming. And if you taste it now, it's gonna be way too salty. But don't worry, it will naturally regulate itself. I promise you that. Covered in salt, let's go ahead and put that behind me. Next, let us move on to Mr. Red Onion. And so let's talk about what I wanna do for him, what I have envisioned for him. Let's get another nice big bowl. I have this quarter of a red onion from another use and I have another red onion here, okay? Yeah, Robert Pop, that sounds like a steak salad. That sounds like a steakhouse salad. Steakhouse salads are one of the most egregious. They are terrible. So, everybody, onion. Think about the kinds of onions that you want in your salad. Do you want big chunks or do you want little chunks? Me personally, I kind of want a small dice of onion in the salad. One of the things that I hate most, biting into a big piece of red onion that's super, super pungent. Okay, so we're going to do the onion fan method. This is a quarter of a red onion, and then we'll be using some more. This is just some onion that I had left over. So everybody, we take the red onion, and we're going to begin fanning it out. Does anybody have any questions? We take it, and we fan it out, just like this, and then we give him a 90 degree turn. Okay, and we fan him out once more, just like that. Okay, and now we can pursue the small dice. All the way through, everybody. Nice and easy. Look at that. That is the kind of pieces that I'm looking for for today's salad. There you go. And let's go ahead and get the rest of it off. Also, Tarina, that is like the third time I think that you've made that joke. 
Okay, beautiful. Guys, look at that. That is the kind of a dice that I'm looking for for the salad. Not too big, not too small. This is exactly what I want out of today. So let's go ahead and take it and scoop it up and put it into the bowl separately because we will also be getting rid of some of the pungency of these onions and let me show you how. But first, let's do some more red onion. I'm thinking I kind of want another half onion in here. So. Here is the head of the onion. Here is the root of the onion. We slice off the head of the onion. And why am I using red onions for this today? I'm using red onions because, simply put, they're really, really pretty. You can use any kind of onion that you would like. I just think the red contrast with the green basil and the yellow corn and the white shrimp would be really, really pleasant, okay? So red onion, we take it and we slice him in half. There you go, okay? And the half of this red onion, I'm going to go ahead and put away into, actually, let's do the smaller half. I don't think I need the crazy amount of red onion. Let's just go ahead and take that and throw that into the fridge. But yeah, red onions are just so pretty. They're so beautiful in salads, okay? But you could use, theoretically, any kind of allium that you would like. You can use red onions, you can use white onions, you can use sweet onions. Use what you have first and foremost. I didn't have any onions at home to get rid of first, okay? So, let's go ahead and just finish peeling him up. There you go. And I'm going to quickly use my bench scraper just to clean up my station. Clean up my station, get rid of any of the onion scraps that we do not want in our final salad. Okay? And guys, we're going to do the same exact onion fan method. So onion, flat side down. Okay? And yeah, red onions are just really, really pretty. Flat side down, everybody. Let's fan him out. We're using the claw, holding it with the base of our thumb, okay? Using our front three fingers to guide and our pinky just to stabilize. Also, Samim, welcome on in. So everybody, we go in and we make an incision. We make an incision. We don't cut all the way to the end because we don't want it to fall apart. We make an incision, we make an incision, make an incision, make an incision, make an incision, and we make an incision. Then we take this to the edge of our table and we make a few flat horizontal incisions. We don't, we don't have the privilege of turning this 90 degrees because this isn't a quartered onion. This is only halved. Okay, so everybody, the onion fan has now been built. All that we have to do, again, your pinky and your thumb in a claw grip, they hold the food together, and you're only moving back these three fingers, okay? So we take it, and we slice 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 it, and slice it, and slice it. Just like that, everybody. That is exactly what I am looking for. Beautiful. Okay, so guys, take a look. We have all of our red onion, nice and a small dice. Again, I'm not looking for a fine dice. I'm not looking for a medium dice. I'm just looking for the size pieces that I want in my salad. And it takes, it, it does really pay off to put in a lot of time into this because again, you are looking for a very nice, beautiful, evenly chopped up salad, okay? So let's get the rest of those onions all inside of my bowl. And all I'm going to quickly do, guys, is I'm going to just rinse off this knife. This is a carbon steel knife. And so leaving it wet, leaving it dirty with food, leaving it especially with anything acidic for too long will cause it to develop some rust. You typically have stainless steel knives. They don't do that. Carbon steel ones do risk rusting. So you have to be careful. Okay. Awesome. And I'm just going to wipe off my handle, wipe off my knife. Is everybody still following? Is everybody still watching? I want to hear a nice, yes, chef, from everybody watching, even if it's your first time here. I encourage you to ask me any questions. If you're ever confused about what we're making, you can always type an exclamation mark menu. Okay. My knife should now be fully dried off, and I do mean I want it bone dry. I don't want any moisture on it. Okay. So, everybody, for the salad today, we're going to need some lemon. But the lemon is actually going to be really, really multi-purpose today. The lemon is going to serve so many functions. So let's talk about that really quickly. Onions are pungent. Onions can make you cry. Okay, also that's not enough yes chefs. I want to hear it from everybody. If you already say it, you don't have to say it again. Onions are really, really pungent. A very nice way with naturally dealing with the pungency of the onions is to soak them in some acid. Specifically, we have this lemon juice that we're already gonna use for the dressing. Let's use the existing lemon juice that we have planned inside of the onions. We'll take out the onion juice, we'll make a dressing out of it, or the lemon juice, excuse me, but the lemon juice is going to help kill a lot of that pungency of the onions, okay? But I'm also going to want some lemon zest. 
So let's go ahead and take care of that first. Everybody, my microplane, my lemon. Why are we taking the zest of the lemon? The topmost layer of the yellow skin of the lemon is where all of the aroma is. It has so much flavor, it has so much aroma, okay? And that is what is going to give our salad dressing a lot of the lemoniness. The, the lemon juice doesn't have lemon flavor. It's all in the skin, my friends. So we're just going through it. Okay, and a very nice way to do it, you hold it, you use your thumb to pivot, and you rotate around it. You rotate, and you rotate, and you rotate, and you don't have to go deep. If you go too deep, you'll get the bitter white part of the lemon, and that is all of the lemon uh, zest that we're going to need for today. So I'm going to go ahead and just take that away, put that onto a separate little plate until we are ready to use it. And that is going to go directly into the salad dressing, my friends. Okay. Now that we have the lemon all zested, let's go ahead and juice him. And as always, I hate juicing lemons by hand. You get lemon juice all over yourself, it's acidic, it dries out your hands, and it's also a lot of effort and it's inefficient. So instead, let's just use one of my favorite kitchen tools, the citrus press. I'm just slicing off this like super pointy bit of the lemon, just so it has a bit of an easier time. Guys, if you don't have a citrus press, I really think you should invest in one. They're a lifesaver, they make it so much easier. Lemon, flesh side down, okay? And now big, big, big squeeze. And juice that lemon, my friends. Juice it and put all of that lemon juice inside of the red onions, guys. Juice it, juice it, juice it, all the way in, and lemon juice on the onions. Let's take out this lemon half that has now been, guys, that is a juiced lemon half, if I've ever seen one. And let's go in with the next one. Take it, squish it all the way down. Okay, and lemon juice inside of the red onions, guys. This is so efficient, it's so much easier than using your hands. Please, please, please invest in a citrus press. Take it, press it, and in it all goes lovely. Let's go ahead and toss this out. And I'm gonna go ahead and put the citrus press behind me. Um, I don't think I'm gonna need it for anything else today, but I'll just keep it around just in case. Okay, and all I'm gonna do is I'm just going to mix it around. And I'm specifically using the KitchenAid one, the KitchenAid lemon juice, because uh, it's able to be um, used on a tabletop instead of just in your hands. So, mixing it around with all of the onions, I wanna make sure that all of the onions are nice and covered in the lemon juice, because this is going to help kill the pungency of the onion. And once again, we will just simply set it aside and set it behind us. Gorgeous. Oh, guys, this pesto that we made, this pesto, so aromatic, so delicious, so fresh. That is beautiful. Okay, dokie, okay. what else do we have to do? This is going to be a shrimp corn salad. So let's start talking about Mr. Corn. Everybody, I'm getting out a couple of sheet trays. Okay, let's talk about the corn. I have here three lovely cobs of corn and I'm setting my broiler on to high. So what do I like doing instead of just boiling corn? I love charring the corn, my friends. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to simply take these bad boys, we're going to oil them up, okay? We're gonna oil them up and we're going to stick them under the broiler. They're going to get nice and cooked. They're going to get nice and charred and smoky. This almost reminds me of like a grilled corn, right? Of like a grilled charred street corn, okay? So all that I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and get a sheet tray ready to go for us. And then after the chars, we'll then take it off of the cob itself. Also, it is a nice knife. Thank you, ball baggers. So everybody, I have a sheet tray right here with its name on it, okay? Let's go ahead and line this sheet tray with some aluminum foil. And again, I apologize for sniffling. I'm still just getting over being sick. And so we're gonna be using our broiler for this, okay? Uh, why am I using the broiler? Well, it's a really nice way of sort of replicating the sheer amount of uh, heat that you get from something like a grill. You're able to get everything nice and evenly charred. So uh, this is a very nice way to get comfortable to start playing around with the broiler that you may have at home. I find that a lot of home cooks don't really know how to use it correctly. It's really nice sometimes for making steaks. One of my favorite things to do though is to char things on it. Okie dokie. So all of my little cobs of corn guys. And here's what I'm gonna do. I'm actually going to stack them this way. And let me tell you why. You need to think about the structure of the oven. Everybody think about the structure of the broiler. The broiler in most home ovens is a single unit in the center that runs this way. If we were to stack up all of my corn like this, what ends up happening is this part ends up getting charred the most, okay? 
uh, but then these parts don't really get that much love. And so we could theoretically just put into the oven the other way, but I think this way will help them uh, to not roll around nearly as much. So what is the next thing that we have to do? We need to put in a little bit of oil. And I do truly want to emphasize a little bit. We don't want to put in too much oil because then it can start splashing up at the boiler and it can be a bit of a hazard. Okay, it can start catching on fire. It can cause us all sorts of problems, which we are not personally looking to have at all. I'm just getting my boiling sheet tray in the uh, oven ready to go. So we're going to use a higher smoke point oil. So in this case, um, I actually have a little bit of peanut oil, which I'll be using just to glaze them up slightly. And I do mean slightly glaze them up. And then the oil is going to help the corn to actually stick to some salt. So let me go ahead and grab a little brush. A little brush has now just been acquired and I'm just going to go ahead and pour this onto the brush. And let's go ahead and glaze up the corn, my friends. Just a little bit. Again, this is just to help get this nice and evenly browned. And it's also to help the salt to stick on it. We do not need a lot of oil for this. In fact, less is more with something like this, okay? So just rotate them, just get them all slightly sticky. Can I please get a yes, chef? Slightly, slightly rub down with oil, just sticky enough that it's gonna be able to hold on to the seasoning. There you go, lovely. And now let's hit it with some salt, everybody. Nice and generous, every single one. And no butter, because again, this is going under the broiler. This is going to get charred and it's going to get smoky. Okay, if we did butter, the butter would immediately burn. This corn is going to be used for a salad. So as delicious as corn and butter are together, it, butter is not viable under a broiler. A broiler is so hot that it would just all immediately burn. So nice and generously covered with some salt now, guys. I'm going to go ahead and stick this bad boy under the broiler. I'm just washing my hands off of that oil, making sure that they're staying nice and clean. Okay, and let's go ahead and stick it in in just a second. I'm just making some space out here. Okay, does anybody have any questions about anything that we're making today at all? There's no such thing as a bad question after all. Okay. So yes, butter is an after cooking deal, but because this is going in a salad, I mean, we're gonna still be building a dressing for the salad. We don't really need to worry about that. Guys, take a look. Okay, this is our corn. It's gonna be ready to go under the broiler. And again, we don't want it to roll around too much. So just find a nice flat, stable side for it. And again, we're keeping it as close to the center element as possible. Nice and close to the center element because the fire is right here. Okay, and we're gonna get all sides of the corn nice and charred and smoky. Could you just do boiled corn for a salad? Absolutely. But where is the fun in that, my friends? The charred corn, it's gonna have like these really, really beautiful black grill marks on it. It's going to provide a really nice smokiness into the whole thing. You cannot go wrong with this step. So, we're going to add it in under the broiler, directly just down the middle, my friends. And then we have to babysit this thing with the broiler, you have to check it every so often. Don't worry about opening the oven or anything, guys. Because again, we're not looking to keep the air temperature inside. All of the heat is on top. We need to babysit it to make sure it doesn't burn too much. Uh, so do I leave the door open a bit? I do not, Robert Bob, because then I would just end up bumping into it all the time because it's quite, it, it's just behind me. Okay, I am going to take a second and once again, put a couple of things into the dishwasher before we proceed with everything else that we need for the salad. And then we could finally, of course, talk about the shrimp as well. Okay. That's all done, that's all put away. Let's also put the salt away a little bit. Okay, just get that out of sight, get that out of mind. Okay, I'm actually really, really excited to talk to you about uh, the purpose of the shrimp, why I'm even doing the shrimp salad to begin with, why was this my choice? We have a lot of reasonings here, we have a lot of different things that you and I, that's us, hi. How are we doing guys? We doing good? Are my little sous chefs doing good? Okay, um, we, we'll talk about why we're using the shrimp to begin with and, and so on and so forth, okay? So I'm just gonna get rid of my cutting board really quickly just so that we don't accidentally contaminate it or anything. I dropped my microplane on my foot so luckily I did not injure myself in the process. Okay. And so everybody, let's talk about Mr. Shrimp for a second, because this is something I'm actually quite excited for. So everybody, let me talk to you all about something really quickly. 
Okay. I think that more the people need to get into the habit of cooking shrimp. But specifically, I find that a lot of people don't really know when it actually comes to beginning with shrimp. So everybody, here is your first rule for buying shrimp. I'm going to teach you all how to buy shrimp. Also, Modern Ghost, welcome on in. It's lovely to have you. I'm going to teach you all how to buy shrimp. Everybody, I have a bag of frozen shrimp here. Number one rule, you do not buy defrosted shrimp from the counter. Can I please get a yes chef? Defrosted, the shrimp that you buy at a fish counter, at a fish store, has already been previously frozen. It has been frozen and has been sitting there and getting fishier for who knows how long it has been sitting out. To buy the freshest shrimp imaginable, unless you live right by a, a shrimp boat, or you just caught it yourself, or you bought it live, the only way that you can get fresh shrimp is through frozen shrimp. Once again, defrosted shrimp in the supermarket is already frozen and defrosted. So you're only buying frozen shrimp. Second of all, you're looking for this denotation, individually quick frozen. Why do we get individually quick frozen and what's the difference? Individually quick frozen shrimp are exactly what they say they are. You get little frozen shrimp instead of a big block of shrimp in the ice itself. Individually quick frozen shrimp have a better texture and they defrost quickly. So. All of the shrimp guys, I bought it and all I did in a bowl, I ran it under some cold running water to defrost it. It takes five to 10 minutes to defrost. And then I just had it sitting in a strainer to get rid of all of this excess liquid. This is called the easy peel shrimp, meaning it has the head removed and it has the vein removed. Ideally you would buy head on shrimp, uh, but there is a reason why we bought it with uh, the shells on. Why do we buy the shells? Well, the shells will actually help protect the meat from overcooking when we do actually get to the cooking stage of it, okay? If it was just uh, plain meat, if it was just still completely exposed meat, uh, you add it into the boiling water, and then the outer part of the shrimp is actually just going to end up overcooking, okay? So the shrimp in this case, guys, I had it under some cold running water, but yeah, flash frozen. Flash frozen is individually quick frozen. I believe they are interchangeable in this case. So really, really quickly frozen under some cold running water. It takes almost no time at all for it to properly defrost, guys, okay? And so, how do we actually cook the shrimp? So I have a problem. I have an issue with the way that people cook shrimp for salads. I need everybody to tap in. I need everybody to listen to this. Here's what people do for shrimp cocktails. Here's what people do for shrimp salads. They take the shrimp and they plunge it into boiling water. And you know what happens? The outside of the shrimp becomes rubbery and overcooked. Everybody, the key to cooking shrimp, the key to cooking any protein all the way through and keeping it tender is to do it low and slow. And so we will be doing a low and slow method starting off in cold water, just like you would something like potatoes, just like you would when we do a poached chicken. We are gonna be poaching the shrimp. We do not boil it. We don't plunge it into boiling water. We gently, slowly poach it. And the beauty of gently, slowly poaching it, everybody, is we do not get overcooked shrimp by the end of it. So let's go ahead and get that ready for the gentle poaching process. I just have a little teeny tiny pot, okay? A little pot. I'm going to just be adding my shrimp in directly. There you go. Okay, and this is all the shrimp that I'm going to be using for the salad today, guys. The reason why I really want the shrimp salad is because I just want a very nice accessible source of protein whenever I want. I want to be able to go into my fridge and just have something already made and already ready to go. Because again, again and again, that is what it means to truly cook at home. To cook at home is to not make a meal every single day. To cook at home is to make things that you can easily take with you to work. To make something that you can easily reheat. So G spent, we're not shelling the shrimp because the shells are going to help prevent the outside from overcooking, okay? And so by preventing the outside from overcooking, it's not gonna be rubbery. So the shells are kind of like the chicken skin when we make a poached chicken. So I'm going to just add in some nice cool water. We're starting off in cold, cold water and we just wanna make sure that all of the shrimp is nicely covered with said cold water, okay? And now guys, really, really important, let's make sure that we're fully seasoning the shrimp nice and generously with some salt. But before we do that, let's actually inspect. Let's see how Mr. Corn is doing. 
okay? Because remember, we still have the coin going. We still have the coin under the broiler. Remember when I said it had to be babysat? This is what it means to babysit it. Every so often, we're going to take it out, and then every so often, we need to also rotate it subsequently. So, this is how my charred coin is developing, everybody. Come take a look. Okay, that looks quite good at the moment, doesn't it? But that's only one side of the coin that is even getting properly charred to begin with. So, we need to give it a good old Darium Guardian. I don't know why I said it that way. We gotta go ahead and give it a little rotation. Give it a little rotation. Okay, onto the next side that needs to be charred, on the next side that needs to be ready to go for us. Okay. And let's get it going, guys. Let's get that now back under the broiler. Let's get it going. It's gonna be nice and charred and smoky. This is why we do this process. Could you just boil this coin? Yeah, but what's the fun in that? You don't have to do this step, guys. If you don't wanna put in that kind of effort, you don't have to do it. But I promise you, if you want to do it, it just does result in so much of a tastier product. And this also just goes back to this cooking idea that I keep teaching people over and over again. Food is as only as good as the intentions applied to it. So, would you have a bad coin salad without charring it? No, but it would just lack that smokiness. So if you want that smokiness, if your goal is to get a maximum flavor um, of a salad, okay, then you chug it. Chef, there are knives and utensils in my broiler. Oh, Bulbagus, I know that feeling. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I really did when I first started to cook, I grew up in New York City. I live in New York City now. This is the apartment I've grown up in. Um, you know, like everybody else, we used to throw pots and pans inside of the oven. I did everything in my power to make sure that my oven is empty. Guys, my biggest flex is that my oven is empty in New York City, that I don't have to take stuff out of my oven in New York. I know, crazy, insane. I put in a lot of effort into organizing this kitchen when I was like 13 years old or so. Okay, so guys, let's go ahead and season this guy generously with some salt because we want to make sure that our shrimp is nicely and fully seasoned, okay? Very little of the salt is actually going to end up penetrating the shrimp and also make sure that you check the bag. Sometimes shrimp has salt added to it already when you buy it, okay? So, remember when I said we might need some lemon juice? Well, we're actually going to boil. We're going to boil the shrimp alongside some lemon juice and let me talk to you why. For a lot of shrimp salads, for a lot of different shrimp dishes, you know, people sometimes they boil it in a stock, they sometimes boil it in all these other things. Um, I believe this was another article that I read on Serious Eats about how the only thing that people kind of end up tasting is just the lemon juice afterwards. And so, we're going to season this. We're going to season it. I don't know what demographic does this, but I'm part of it. That's just called living in a small apartment. That is just small apartment, uh, you know, living conditions. Okay guys, so once again, let's get that citrus press. I knew I needed it for something. Let's get it and let's get all of that lovely lemon juice inside of this boiling, well, soon to be boiling water. Well, never actually boiling, in fact. Okay, all that lemon juice inside, in it goes. Awesome, and let's go ahead and get rid of the rest of the lemon. Okay, the Citrus Press has done a wonderful job for us today. Guys, this is what's going to just be cooking along. We're not going to cook it immediately though, because again, we're still babysitting the corn. But the key to this, everybody, the key, the way that we're gonna be cooking this shrimp is gentle, gentle, slow cooking. And it is essential that we do it this way, everybody. By doing it this way, by doing slow, slow cooking, we make sure that the shrimp does not overcook on the outside. Because again, people, they think for a shrimp cocktail, they have to take it and they have to plunge it into boiling water and then take it out. You put the shrimp into boiling water, the outside will overcook before the inside is done. Guys, the thicker your piece of meat is, or rather the less that you wanna overcook it, the slower that you cook it. Can I please get a yes chef? Please and thank you. So it's not traditional to do it this way, right? It's not traditional, but it will still yield an amazing, incredible result. Um, okay, we're not gonna prepare an ice bath because we're not cooking in boiling water. When we take it out, I'm just gonna go ahead and rinse it under cold running water from my sink. Um, in the meantime, let's see that coin. Ooh, guys, actually the coin needs to be checked on immediately. It might have charred a little bit too much on that one side. Again, remember when I said we have to babysit it? We have to babysit it. Okay, there you go, lovely. Actually, it's only that center coin that's really getting a lot of that heat. Guys, look at that coin. Nice and hard, nice and smoky. That is exactly what we're looking for. That is going to yield a delicious salad, my friends. So let's continue to rotate it, right? We wanna make sure that all of the sides are getting some love, okay? And not just one of the sides. 
all of the sides of the coin are getting an equal, equal amount of love. There you go. Nice and chugged, nice and smoky. It's gonna give us a nice delicious salad, everybody. Okay. I'm just gonna go ahead and take it and put that back under the broiler and keep it going, keep letting it do its thing. And we still have to prep the rest of the salad ingredients. We have to check up on the tomatoes, see how that's doing. Okay, awesome. You guys excited about this? I'm excited about this. So, remember when I said all of the excess water is gonna come out of the tomatoes? Guys, look at it happen now. You see that tomato water? That tomato water would have ended up making your salad soggy. That is why we give it the pre-salting. And we're keeping it in a bowl to just keep it submerged in all of that salt still, okay? And we're going to lose all that tomato liquid and we'll have a lovely salad by the end of it, okay? So that is just going to continue to sit behind all of us. Just sit behind all of us and we're going to go ahead and get the rest of the prep work done for today. Okie dokie. So what else do we need to do for the salad today, guys? Um, well, we have some jalapenos that we need to dice up. We have some basil as well. So let's begin to process the basil. Everybody, the goal for the basil. So this is going to be very contrary to the pesto, but the pesto had the oil to protect it. We're not gonna be crushing the basil. We're not gonna be chopping it. We're not gonna be destroying it. We're going to be gently, gently slicing it, everybody. Okay, so here's what we do. We take the basil leaves and we stack them up from largest to smallest. We stack them up and then we roll them up nice and gently. And then everybody, we take a nice long knife. We hold it like a little baby bird, not so gently that it flies away and not so firmly that we crush its little brains out. All that we need to do guys is nice, thin, thin, thin slices, minimal vertical force. You don't want the basil to turn brown. You don't want it to oxidize. We're using the fullest length of our knife. Nice thin slices so it evenly distributes in the salad. And then in a second, I'll also go back and check the corn once more. Slice it, my friends. Slice it, slice it, slice it, just like this. Chef, can we find these recipes somewhere? So, Balbagas, the answer is no, because all of these are techniques. I don't want anybody here to recreate anything that I'm doing here. I want you all to think about the techniques that I'm using here. So, I want you just to adapt this to the ingredients that you have at home instead. None of these are recipes. This is all technique. This is all theory. Let's go back to Mr. Quinn. But yeah, I'm not here to teach you recipes, not here to teach you the perfect combinations. I'm here to teach you how to understand these ingredients. And that is why I want all of you to ask me questions. Guys, look at that corn. Look at it. Looks like it came right off of the grill, except we did it at home. Let's go ahead and flip these around once more because these guys still have a bit of a naked side to them. And I don't want to see that. It's not allowed on, on Twitch.tv, that is. No naked corn. None of that. Instead, I'm actually going to take this little guy. He's all done, he's all charred for us. I'm going to set him aside and just let him cool off because he does not need to char anymore. These bad boys do need to continue charring. They need to continue getting nice and smoky. But yes, there is no recipe here. All of these recipes, guys, all of these different dishes I'm coming up with, I'm coming up with on the fly. Okay, I'm just simply looking in my fridge and I'm using what I already have available to me at home. And that is the way that you need to be cooking at home. And so if you have any questions about how to use a certain ingredient, that's what I want you to ask me. How do I use this vegetable? How would I prep, uh, prepare this for a salad? Ask me that and I promise, I promise that I'll deliver. Okay, back under the broiler it goes guys, because again, the goal is to get this nice and beautifully smoky. Nice and smoky and delicious. Okay, again, it does tend to roll over a little bit. I don't need it to roll over. I just need that nice naked side to get nice and charred. Okay, okay. So everybody, take a look. Look at my basil. It's nice and fresh, nice and green. It's not bleeding. It's not bruised. That is exactly what it should look like. Okay, beautiful. So I'm just going to go ahead and get that transferred over into my final salad bowl that I'll be using for this today. So all of my fresh basil leaves just goes directly inside my friends. Look at it, nice and bright and green, nice and aromatic and delicious. Okay, and now let's go ahead and do the jalapeno. Guys, this is a massive jalapeno that I have here. So something that you need to understand about jalapenos. This is a massive jalapeno, by the way. Look at this thing, huge. Jalapenos vary incredibly in terms of their intensity. Okay, some jalapenos some days will be um, you know, they'll just be spicier than others. 
okay? Jalapenos are actually quite literally being bred out to be more mild as time goes on, which is kind of unfortunate. So the best way to actually test for the jalapeno spiciness is just taste it. Let us just taste it. So here's what we're gonna do. We're going to take it, we're gonna cut off the top. If it's too spicy, we take the seeds out. If it's not spicy, we leave the seeds in. We take it, we slice it in half lengthwise, and then we go ahead and we grab a little bit of it. Oh, exceptionally spicy jalapeno today. I immediately put it in my mouth. Mm. In which case, guys, for today, we take the seeds out. So let me show you the best way to take the seeds out, and I'm gonna glove up for this so that I don't get capsaicin fingers, and then put my fingers in places they don't belong afterwards. But before we do that, let's go ahead and give our corn one last look. Everybody, that is now properly, beautifully charred corn. That is what it should look like. And that is why we did this for the salad. Nice and smoky, nice and delicious. Also, everybody, once again, if you would like to support the cooking show, if you'd like to support what we do here, my goal is to keep this information. My goal is to keep all of this information that I'm teaching you all free for everybody to watch and consume. I will never have ads turned on Twitch. I can't turn off the pre-roll ads, but I will never have ads on Twitch, everybody. I will never take any sponsorships as well because my goal is to keep this information free for everybody to watch. And I strongly do not believe in shilling Okay, some sort of an advertisement in, or, or taking some sort of a sponsorship that I don't actually truly believe in. Okay, so the way to really support this, exclamation mark Patreon, if you have the money to support it, and if not, then that's okay too. So, everybody, my corn is full, uh, has finished charlic. I now have my lovely jalapenos here. Okay, and all that we're going to do, we're going to slice them in quarters, just like this. We're gonna slice them in quarters so that we can easily take out the seeds. Now that we have the quarters exposed, we can just take your paring knife, go through it, and take out the seeds and the white part. Because the seeds and the white part is where the majority of the heat, not all of the heat, um, that is where the majority of the heat is stored within the jalapeno, okay? So just take it and just get it out of there. And it's okay if you leave a couple of them inside because it's still just going to add in a little bit of nice spiciness, okay? So just take it and get it out of there. Get it out, lovely, and just a few more. That's one, and that is two. Again, it's okay to have a little bit. I honestly might be really diligent about getting rid of all of the white part because, again, this jalapeno today, it really did surprise me with uh, how spicy it was. So I kind of don't want any of that heat. Okay. Lovely. Okay. So guys, let's talk about the way that I actually want to dice this for the salad. I want to cut the jalapenos the smallest out of any other vegetable. And the reason for this, okay, the reason for this is because I'm not looking to bite into a massive chunk of jalapeno. I'm looking for the spice to be evenly distributed throughout the salad. And the way that we achieve that is with a nice small dice. Can I please get a yes chef? Please and thank you. So here's all that we're going to do, everybody. We're going to take it and we're going to cut this into lovely little batons, nice, Thin, thin, thin batons, just like this, all the way through, okay? We get all of these little strips of jalapeno. Can you save the seeds for white part or something else? Um, you could theoretically dry it and make your own like chili flakes out of it or something. Uh, I don't know. My answer is I don't know. You could just add it in as heat, but the seeds don't have a lot of flavor. It's just pure spice. So I wouldn't feel too bad about wasting it. I wouldn't feel too bad about throwing it away or anything. Okay, so everybody, again, thin, thin, thin batons, because my goal, okay, is not to get a massive chunk of jalapeno. The jalapeno is supposed to evenly immerse itself in the salad, okay, evenly season everything up. Oh, trust me, ball baggers, we have done this many, many times here before. So now that we have all of these batons, everybody, take a look. We're going to take them, stack them up, and now we get the fine dice of our dreams. Look at that, beautiful. Look at those lovely slices. That is exactly what I'm looking for. I just realized that a couple of batons stuck to the edge of my knife there. Hence why some of them were not coming out all the way. And so the spätzle is gonna be the last thing that we do, everybody. Thank you for being patient for the ride. Thank you for being so patient for this process. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Ooh. Guys, this is a lot of jalapeno, isn't it? He was massive, wasn't he? 
I think I might just start off with half of this, taste the salad, and then decide if I want to use the rest of it. Because I'm not looking for, again, my, my salad to be like that outrageously spicier than I think. It's, it was, typically jalapenos are nothing. This one, for some reason today, he was something. Okay, so we're gonna just do half of the jalapeno for now. Because remember, you can always add, but you can't really take away. Okay, so just make your life a little bit easier later on, guys. Don't shoot yourself in the foot. Just add it in later. So let's just take it and scoop it up. And I'm gonna just set that aside just in case we decide to use it. Okay, dokie. So that looks good. Wah. The spice is still like lingering on my lips. That one little piece, that one little teeny tiny shred that I put on, I immediately felt it, everybody. Okay. So we are now going to begin cooking the shrimp, everybody. So let's go ahead and get that going. I'm just gonna go ahead and get my sheet tray out of here because it has no more use for us. Just gonna take a quick little second to clean up. Also, Conway, welcome on in. Lovely to have you. Welcome, welcome. It's been a bit, hasn't it? Okay. So everybody, let's talk about cooking the shrimp one more time. Gonna just get that onto the heat and we will discuss what we need to discuss. So everybody, the key to cooking the shrimp, we don't start it out in boiling water. You start it out in boiling water and you are going to end up with a bunch of overcooked shrimp on the outside. When you overcook shrimp, the outside is rubbery. Okay, so we poach it, everybody. We do the same technique that we apply to potatoes. We do the same technique that we apply to poached chicken whenever we're doing like a Hainanese chicken rice. We poach it. Can I please get a yes, chef? And so we keep the shell on and we keep the tail on. Why do we keep the shell on and the tail on? Because it protects the meat. We'll still be discarding the shrimp's uh, shells and the tails, okay, but we'll be uh, it'll be protecting the meat from getting too overcooked, okay? Because it's like this really, really nice little buffer, okay? So far, this is where we learn. Absolutely, this is why I'm happy to have you. If you have any questions about shrimp, please ask me. Because remember, I'm here to help you out. So guys, the goal, this water is never going to boil. I need to hear your chef right now. This water is never going to boil. It is never going to boil. It is never going to bubble. This water is going to be hot. Okay, we're not gonna temperature probe it or anything. We're not gonna do anything crazy like that. But the goal again is to not overcook the outside of the shrimp itself. Once the water gets hot enough, it's only going to be about maybe five minutes of cook time in total. Okay, so really quickly, once again, I'm just going to wash off my knife because again, it's a carbon steel knife. I gotta wash it off every so often just to make sure that no food is stuck to it so that it won't rust. And then I have to thoroughly, thoroughly dry it off. I will work on the rest of the stuff for the salad, guys. Since I moved away from the coast, the flash frozen tip, the flash frozen tip is great since my options are limited now. That's right, ball baggers. That is the tragedy of, you know, not being in a really coastal area. Did you have like fresh shrimp? Did you have like shrimp boats near you, ball baggers? If so, you're incredibly lucky. Very few people can say that. So, guys, do you want to do a little recap session? Is everybody ready for a little recap? We'll just talk about everything that we have accomplished so far for anybody that might just now be tuning in. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about this now. Everybody, what are we doing today? We are doing a homemade spätzle. Let me show you my lovely, beautiful spätzle batter. What is spätzle? Spätzle is a German dumpling. Why do I love doing spätzle at home, everybody? It's because making fresh pasta at home is a headache. This is how you get fresh noodles. This is how you get fresh pasta. You make a spätzle. Simple batter, flour, milk, eggs, salt, a little bit of nutmeg, whisked it up, and then we'll be putting it into boiling water using a special tool. Additionally, we made this incredible, this luxurious homemade pesto, everybody. We made it in a mortar and pestle. It is green, it is delicious, it is vibrant, it is so flavorful. And that is gonna be with the spätzle. We are doing a charred corn tomato salad with shrimp. So I charred up some corn. We have some tomatoes sitting in salt to get rid of the excess liquid. We sliced up some basil, we sliced up some jalapenos, and now we are gently simmering the shrimp, everybody, in some nice hot water. We're poaching it. We're not boiling it. We're not attacking it with a lot of heat. We are just going to gently, gently cook this, my friends. So all we have to do, we never want this to go up uh, past like a very gentle, littlest, littlest, tiniest bubble, okay? That is the extent of the heat that we're looking for out of this. 
Okay, and I'm just going to take a second just to once again clean up my station. Okay, and then I think we should build the salad dressing for today. I think I'm gonna be doing my salad dressing inside of a blender um, with like the lemon juice and stuff. Okay, so I think we should go ahead and get that going as well in the meantime. So the shrimp is going. This is my jalapenos and my fresh basil, guys. Really, really nice and beautiful. My uh, corn is currently cooling down. Let's begin building the dressing for today, okay? So here's all that we're going to need. I am going to do one whole garlic clove. So let's talk about this really quickly. Everybody, do you remember when I said that lemon juice kills the pungency of garlic? Well, uh, of onion, excuse me. Ah, I just spoiled the surprise. Remember when I said that? Remember what I said it does to the onion? Okay, guess what it also does to garlic? By blending the garlic whole, or rather we'll just chop it up a little bit to help out my little teeny tiny food processor, my little tiny blender here. By keeping the garlic intentionally whole, we, when we blend it down with the lemon juice, we actually don't produce a lot of the allicin. We don't end up producing a lot of what ends up making it super, super pungent, okay? So that's going to make it really, really nice. It's going to make it really, really delicious. We're gonna get a lot of flavor out of it that way, but we're not going to get much of the uh, like super harshness out of it, okay? So I'm just taking a second. I actually need my salad bowl to be empty for now. And we'll talk about why in a little bit. Actually, I'm, I'm gonna just tell you now. It's because we're gonna make the salad dressing in this. Ah, am I gonna do any, wait a second. Am I gonna do something that crazy? Am I gonna do like a whole like whisked emulsified dressing? Yeah, yeah, let's be fancy. Let's be extra with it today, guys. Okay, I just touched a bunch of jalapenos with my fingers. Everybody, uh, you, you may know what will happen to me next, but that's okay. If you guys, if you guys know, you know. I will at some point eventually end up touching my eyes or somewhere else, and it will just be over for me from that point onwards. Okay. So I need to grab a little teeny tiny strainer. What is my little strainer? Okay, so remember all of my lemon juice that was helping out Mr. Onion? Okay, let's just go ahead and get all of my lemon juice now strained out and into this instead. And into the garlic guys. Okay, that's the majority of the lemon juice that's going to be used for the dressing. Okay, and the shrimp is going, everybody. It looks wonderful. Let's go ahead and get a nice big, big, big spoonful of Dijon mustard, because I love Dijon mustard. So delicious, so yummy. You can't go wrong with Dijon mustard. Nice spoon of that, just going directly in. Not too much, not too little, because too much Dijon mustard can easily become overpowering. And we'll do a little bit of salt and the lemon zest, of course. So guys, remember my lemon zest from all of that lemon juice, okay? We have this lovely, lovely, fresh lemon zest that is going to contribute so much aroma to this, into the Dijon mustard, into the lemon juice. It all goes. And now finally, we do a little bit of black pepper. Hi, Natalie, welcome on in. All the black pepper inside, everybody. Grind it up, grind it up, grind it up. And then we're also gonna get some salt in there to help with the abrasion of it. Some black pepper, and last but not least, everybody, a little bit of salt. So, why am I not blending the olive oil? Again, remember when I talked about how olive oil, if you blend it, it ends up agitating it so much that you end up getting some of the bitterness out of it. So what we're going to do, we're going to blend all of my ingredients for the dressing together, and then I'll be whisking in, whisking in, whisking in all of my olive oil. Okay, so the rest of my Dijon mustard goes in there. I don't think I'm going to need anything else particularly for the dressing. So I'm just going to go ahead and top it off. And I'm just gonna quickly blend it down. I don't think that needs to happen on camera. Okay, I just have a blender ready set up off camera that I can just use instead. You guys don't really need to see that process. We're just going to blend it until it is completely and utterly smooth. So, blender on, get it going. <coughs> And just blend it up. Get it all blended up. 
I apologize for not showing the blending process, but this guy's this step is completely unnecessary to really show off. It's just the lemon juice, the mustard, okay, and the garlic. Okay, really, really easy. So guys, take a look at the shrimp. Take a look at the shrimp. It's beginning to turn slightly orange. Again, we never want this water to come up to a boil. We never want it to come up to a boil, everybody. We want it to just be gently, gently poaching in this liquid. And we have a good indication of its doneness when it's fully curled up. At the moment, it's not fully curled up yet. It still is going to need a few more minutes just being in the hot water. Everybody, again and again, I'm going to keep on emphasizing hot water, not boiling. I need to hear your chef. Boiling water, you will overcook the outside of the shrimp and it will become rubbery. The goal of the shrimp, guys, is for it to sit in the fridge, for it to become this really lovely, delicious shrimp salad. Okay? So, I'm just agitating it every so often. I'm just taking a look, seeing how it's doing, okay? It's going to probably need, in total, maybe two to three minutes more of just sitting in this hot, hot water. This does work for potatoes, too, right? We do the potatoes in cold water and we never boil it, so the outside of the potato doesn't end up overcooking either. You have the absolute right idea. And so, in the meantime, we're just going to go ahead and dump so remember my garlic, my Dijon, okay, and my lemon juice. Oh no, it did not fully blend at all, actually. Well, that's tough. Well, whatever, I have little garlic pieces in there. We'll, we'll deal with it, I suppose. I should have blended it longer, I suppose. That's what happens when I don't show the blending process. This is what I, I deserve this, actually. I'm just gonna go ahead and throw this into my dishwasher really, really quickly. So we'll come back to that in just a second. We'll come back about that. We'll come back and talk to it in a second. In the meantime, again, we're still babysitting the shrimp, everybody. We're babysitting it. We're never walking away from it for too long because again, we're not looking for the shrimp to get overcooked. So take a look. That is now exactly what the shrimp should look like, everybody. That is now a fully, fully cooked piece of shrimp. So let's go ahead and we're going to take it out and we're going to put it into a bowl and we're going to start running cold water under it. Let's take it out. And again, you don't have to shock this in an ice bath. You don't have to do anything crazy like that because it was not in boiling water. It's not going to overcook in a second. Okay, so I'm just going to take it all out. I'm going to use my spider to just lift all of it up. Lift it up, lift it up. Beautiful, beautiful color on the outside. Okay, it's going to be perfect and gorgeous in the middle. That is all of the cook time that this shrimp is going to need, my friends. And now I'm going to go off camera. I'm going to be running this under some nice cold water to stop the cooking. Stop the cooking, everybody. It is done. It, the shrimp does not need to cook anymore. Nice, cold, cold water. Cold water right from the faucet should be more than okay. So everybody, please forgive me as I'm taking a second just to get that done and get that out of the way. Awesome. Okay, very cool. All of my shrimp is now fully cooked, everybody. Actually, it still needs to probably sit in some cold water. It's still a little bit warm. We just wanna chill it down so it doesn't curl up anymore, so it doesn't get too tough, so it doesn't get too chewy, okay? And that is done. That is all the cooking that the shrimp needs, everybody. So we need to go ahead and we need to finish the cooking of the, or excuse me, the whisking of the dressing. We have to make the dressing now in just a second. So one second, I'm just going to go ahead and pile up my freshly cooked shrimp. And we'll build the rest of the salad dressing, everybody. Okay, awesome. That's all done. So. We got a whisk of salad dressing with the olive oil because remember the salad dressing is incomplete at its current stage. It is incomplete. It's not ready to go quite yet. I need to just go ahead and grab the whisk. I gotta quickly wash off the whisk. We used the whisk uh, earlier today. I forgot that I'm going to need it again. So I'm just gonna quickly wash this off with a little bit of soap and a little bit of water. Everybody, are you all still watching? Are you all still listening? I wanna hear a nice yes chef, please and thank you. Just quickly washing off my whisk, washing it off, washing it off. Okay, awesome. That is all dry, and that is all ready to go. So everybody, let us build this salad dressing now, okay? So here is the goal. 
We have to slowly, slowly, slowly drizzle in this olive oil, similarly with the pesto, right? Because if we don't add it in slowly, we're going to break the emulsion. The Dijon mustard inside does a really, really good job of holding onto the olive oil and helping it combine with the lemon juice, okay? So we are going to be emulsifying this, everybody. So, bowl, we're going to just set a towel under it. And the reason why we set a towel under it is so that it doesn't slip around when we're mixing it, okay? So we just set a towel, nice and flat. It's just going to do a really good job of helping to hold it together a little bit. Also, John, welcome on in. So, that's a long message. Welcome, welcome. So, everybody, we're whisking this constantly. We're whisking, whisking, whisking. And now we're slowly but surely trickling in olive oil. And we're whisking it all the way inside. The goal is to not break this emulsion. The Dijon mustard and the garlic, they're going to hold it together slightly, but we gotta whisk, my friends. We have to whisk and whisk. Oh, that's too much olive oil. All at once, whisk it quick. Whisk it, whisk it, whisk it, save it. I added in too big of a glug. Add it in, okay, because we want this dressing, guys. We want it to be nice and thick. We want it to coat everything else. So take it and whisk it and whisk it and whisk it, okay? I might have accidentally broken it with that little bit of olive oil, but that's okay. Yeah, it's kind of beating up at the top. It might be over. I think I added too big of a glug of olive oil. It all slipped out at once. But let's save it. Let's just keep whisking. Let's try to save it. I think that should be okay. And let's do a little bit, everybody. Again, the goal, slowly, slowly trickle it. There you go. Oof. My arm is so tired. Guys, we've done so much whisking today. We've done so much mixing of so many different kinds. Come on, buddy. Trickle it in, trickle it in. Yes. Keep it going, keep it going. I'm exhausted of this process. I am so tired of whisking, guys. We did the molka hete today. Oh, when we were making the pesto. Terrible. This is so much effort, so much labor, but it's all going to come together. A little bit of effort, a little bit of love goes a long way. Whisk it, and whisk it, and whisk it, and whisk it. Oh, this sucks. Okay. It's looking pretty good. And guys, again, while we're whisking it in slowly, we don't want to break the emulsion. We want this dressing to be nice and thick and creamy, okay? And if we add in all of the oil at once, it's not going to be thick, it's not going to be creamy. Switch arms, I don't think I'm ambidextrous enough to use my left arm for such a task. Okay, and trickle it, and trickle, 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 trickle. Okay, I have a feeling that this might be good. Let me taste. Oh, that's good. Actually, definitely not enough olive oil at this stage. So I don't think I'm gonna be so lucky. Keep whisking, everybody. Keep whisking, keep going, keep going. Just slowly streaming it all in. Ugh. I'm sick of this. I am sick of this process. I am using extra virgin olive oil, that's right. And the reason why is because it's a really nice, delicious, tasty fat, right? Oh, let me taste. It is getting there. It's nice and lemony, nice and fragrant. Okay, keep going, keep going, keep going. It's getting nice and thick, right? You can see that viscosity, nice and smooth. It's trapping in air, it's trapping in the oil. Oof, almost done everybody. I know, I know this process sucks. Well, I'm actually kind of reassuring myself right now, more than anybody else. Okay, everybody, can we power through this? I need everybody to send me the energy. I need everybody to tell me yes, chef, right now. Please and thank you. We have a little bit more to go. 
Actually, I think it's good. Yep, I'm tasting the olive oil now. That is the balance that I was looking for before. Okay, I'm going to get rid of this pot. I have no use for that. Okay, everybody, there you go. Also, Jonah, let's keep it PG-13 in here, okay? You're welcome to be here. It is lovely to have you, but let's just keep it PG-13 if possible. Everybody, let's go in now with all of my jalapenos and all of my fresh basil. It's okay, it's lovely to have you anyways. Let's go in with all of my lovely red onions that we had set aside, that we had chilling and hanging out and waiting for us, okay? All of my red onions going in now. Awesome. And remember, we soaked them in the lemon juice, specifically so they wouldn't be too pungent, so they wouldn't be too smelly, so they wouldn't completely overpower the palate whenever we bit into them, okay? I'm just taking a second and putting a few things away and into my dishwasher just so that we stay nice and organized. And guys, remember my cherry tomatoes? We had it sitting with all of that uh, salt. This is all of the liquid that we extracted from it. Let's go ahead and quickly strain out those tomatoes. Let's strain them out and then add them on in. And again, we go through this trouble of straining it out just so that we get rid of all of that excess moisture that we want nothing to do with. So I'm just shaking it out over the sink. Shake, 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 shake. Okay, and my tomatoes go inside. Um, no, that's not really the case, Balbagas. Also, we already made the pesto. We're gonna be doing the pesto pasta in just a second, uh, Ahmed. So you still gotta be patient. You gotta be patient a little bit longer, and then we'll get to the pesto, and it's going to be lovely. Okay, so guys, at the moment, we have the tomatoes, we have the onions, we have basically everything that we need in here, except for the shrimp itself. So let me just quickly take the salad. I'm going to toss it together with the dressing, with the jalapenos, with the basil, also cyber goth foods. Well, come on in. We have a really, really beautiful one. What nuts did I use? I used pine nuts, because a pesto's gotta have pine nuts in it. Of course. Guys, look at the salad. This salad is about to really, really come together. And now, last but not least, let us process the corn and let's process the shrimp. Everybody, you remember my corn. It has been beautifully, beautifully charred. Okay, nice and smoky, nice and beautifully seasoned. Let's go ahead, here's what we're gonna do. We're going to slice off one end of the corn so we give ourselves a nice flat edge. We take the corn and we stack it up and now we just shave it down. Be careful not to go too much into the actual cob because the cob is gonna be really, really crunchy and it's going to be quite unpleasant. So we're just shaving it down, everybody. We're shaving it down. Let the knife do the work. Don't force your way into the cob if it doesn't want you then. Let's taste some of the corn. Mm. It's sweet, it's crunchy, it is smoky. It is beautifully charred. It is nice and delicious. Pine nuts, what's a good alternative? I was gonna say sunflower seeds. Sunflower seeds and maybe some combination of nuts uh, actually taste really, really similar to pine nuts. Okay? Just make sure that we're not wasting any of it at all. We're actually just wasting as little as humanly possible. Okay? And let's just flip it back around on this side because we just missed a few. Missed a couple. Let's just get them all out. All of them out, all of them gone. Look at that, guys. Awesome. All of that beautiful, sweet, charred corn. Let's take a bench scraper when our cutting board gets really, really crowded. Let's throw that all inside of my salad bowl. And let's rinse and repeat with every single one of them. And guys, we're going to have a beautiful salad at the end of the day, aren't we? So once again, we're cutting off an end just to give ourselves a nice flat side. And we take it and we shave it down and we shave it down and we shave it down. Okay, that was a little too much into the cob. So we gotta be careful of that. It's okay to waste a little bit of corn instead of getting any of the cob inside because the cob has a dreadful texture. Okay, so a little bit, a little bit. Just shave, 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 shave. Flip it over and shave it, my friends. Shave it. Use a nice little paring knife because you get to really follow the shape of the corn itself. Shave it, shave it, shave it, shave it. That one is all done, my friends. Let's go ahead, pick it up, scoop it up, and get it inside of my bowl. Last but not least, one last little charred thing of corn. In fact, we could probably keep the bottom on him. He's not that uh, unstable. Take a look, my friends. Take a look. 
take a look. Well, no, no, not shelled sun, well, shelled as in you take the shells off the sunflower seeds, just to clarify. Okay? Guys, look at all of that lovely, sweet, delicious corn. Okay. Awesome. And let's scoop it up and throw that into the salad bowl. Guys, last thing that we have to do, we gotta chop up the shrimp. So let me tell you something right now. I hate when people intentionally leave the shrimp whole inside of a shrimp salad to make it look prettier. What happens is you bite into a massive chunk of shrimp and you're not able to get the rest of it incorporated inside of the salad. I wanna chop it up. I wanna make it easy for people to eat. Can I please get a yes chef? That is the beauty of a chopped salad, guys. Make it easy for people to eat before you even worry about how pretty it looks. And even then, that is a gorgeous looking salad, I think. So, easily, easily, easily consumption. That is what we're looking for. Also, guys, once again, if you'd like to support the cooking show, please support the Patreon, exclamation mark Patreon. Otherwise, subs and donos, always appreciated, but the best way to get consistent support is through the Patreon. So, I'm gonna just glove up for this, just to make my life a little bit easier. And then guys, last but not least will be the spätzle and the pesto, and then we will be done with it all. So gloved on up. Let's grab my lovely little shrimps. Each and every single one of them have got to get cut up through the salad today. There you go. And guys, we gently, gently cook them, okay? And by gently cooking them in that way, they're not overcooked, they're not springy, they're not rubbery, they're just going to be nice and tender. We kept the shells on so that we could protect the meat on the inside. And it also just does peel up a lot easier after it has already been boiled. Okay, or after it's already been cooked, excuse me. So guys, take a look. Look at this lovely shrimp. Look at that lovely shrimp. Perfectly cooked, nice and tender, okay? And this is the kind of a salad that is just ideal to have in the fridge. This is so nice when it's fresh and warm. This is nice when it's chilled. This kind of a shrimp salad, everybody, is ideal home cooking, okay? Take it and let's peel it up, let's peel it up. Awesome. Okay, and what do we do, guys? We take it and we peel it up. Every single one of them have got to get peeled. Pop them out, there you go. Look at the shrimp, guys. It's not rubbery. It's nice and tender. It's nice and juicy, nice and seasoned. By poaching it gently, that was the key. That was the trick. There is no trick or secret, but you know, there is one. And so this entire archaic tradition of plunging shrimp into boiling water for the shrimp cocktail, all you end up yielding is overcooked rubbery shrimp on the outside before the inside even has a chance to get done. With gentle cooking methods, we get beautiful poached shrimp. Every single one of them. Get them all peeled, get them all peeled, pop them out. Awesome. And then we'll chop them up, mix up the salad, and then the salad's done. All that'll be left to do is to make the spätzle. Okay. I should not have probably shelled that like directly on top of, you know, the existing ones. But that's okay. There you go. Shrimp are looking very pretty. Why, thank you, ballbaggers. There you go. Couple more to go, my friends, and then we'll just chop them up. We'll chop them up, get them inside of the salad, and it will be ready for consumption. Is everybody excited for the salad? This is a real salad with a lot of love, a lot of protein, a lot of different vegetables, corn in there just for funsies, even if it doesn't have much nutritionally to contribute to anything else. It still is just going to provide a lot of flavor for us, keeping everything nice and sweet, nice and balanced. Okay. Oh, this one's a little tricky. This one, this one's being kind of annoying. Okay. And that seems to be done. And last but not least, this little shrimp has to go as well. So let's pluck them off. And then as for chopping it, we're just going to chop it down lengthwise. We're just going to try and attain little teeny tiny pieces of it. And then that will be all good and all ready to go. Because again, I want the shrimp to be evenly distributed with everything else that is naturally present inside of the salad. The goal is to get a beautiful little fork full of everything and just to have a nice bite that has everything inside of it. I hate shrimp salads that just have a big massive piece of shrimp and then you can't get anything else with the salad. It's basically a shrimp with salad. And that is not what I had in mind for today. 
I love chopped salads. I'd love it when everything is nice and evenly distributed. Everything is nice and evenly, evenly mixed up throughout. But we still want nice meaty pieces. I still want you to know that you're biting into a lovely piece of shrimp. So every single one of them have to go. Ooh, I looked away for a second and I almost got my thumb. Who'd have thought? That's why you should probably watch the cutting board, but that's okay. There you go, there you go. Guys, look at that lovely shrimp. Juicy and bouncy, but not rubbery, not overcooked in the slightest. Look at it go. A few more to go, just chop it up. In fact, I'm gonna taste one. Mm. Guys, that is so, so sweet. That is sweet, that is delicious, that is flavorful. That is a lovely little shrimp, my friends. It is tender, and now it is about to get seasoned with all of our dressing and all of our lovely salad accompaniments. There you go. And last but not least, this little guy. Everybody, all the shrimp is chopped. All of the shrimp is prepped. Let's mix up the salad. Is everybody ready for this? So. Really quickly, I'm just gonna clean up my station, not to be anticlimactic, but I just wanna make sure that we stay clean as we go. Okay, I'm going to throw a couple of things into the dishwasher and then we will mix her up once and for all. Just take that, throw that inside, get rid of my knife. Everybody, you ready for this beautiful salad that we're about to obtain? I wanna hear a nice yes chef from everybody watching, please and thank you. And I do mean everybody. Let's take a look. I do mean everybody. Take a look, guys. The corn, the tomatoes, the red onions, the basil, the jalapeno, the vinaigrette we made out of the lemon juice. Technically not a vinaigrette, but you know. Look at that salad. So many different textures inside. So many different vegetables. It has the spice from the jalapenos. Look at that. That is what a salad should look like. Look at that. Doesn't that look appetizing? Doesn't this look like the kind of a salad that you want to eat? Doesn't this look like the kind of a salad that you crave? Creamy dressing, onion and tomato and basil and jalapeno and shrimp. Guys, with charred smoky corn inside, with basil, beautiful. I'm gonna have this chill out in the fridge. And everybody, we are approaching the final stages. We're approaching the final steps. The last thing that we have to do is to just simply cook the spätzle. It is time for us to cook the spätzle. Is there a place that I'd love to travel to and experience the cuisine of g Spent Gaming? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I'm trying to think about how to answer your question. I'm gonna actually come back to it because we do have a couple of things to do really quickly. Uh, the pesto's already done, Cybergoth. The pesto's already done and all ready to go. And all that we're going to do is we're just going to mix it up in the bowl when we're eating the uh, spätzle itself. Okay? So guys, this water is boiling. I'm just going to take a second and quickly wash out the spider. This is one of my favorite kitchen tools. And we're going to knead it for the spätzle. Okay? So just taking a second making sure I'm staying nice and organized. And I just gotta wash this bad boy off because it was handling the shrimp before. So just gonna give it a little scrub with a little bit of soap, get all the shrimpy stuff off of it. Okay, awesome. Everybody. It is time for us to make the spätzle. This is where the magic happens. Okay. So, my water is boiling and it's all ready to go for today. Let's talk about my batter really, really quickly. Okay? So over here, I have my spätzle batter that has now been properly resting for quite some time. So why did we rest it? Why did we let it do that? We did that so we could fully hydrate the batter. I'm just making sure that none of it is sticking to the plastic wrap. I'll discard the plastic wrap. And now guys, we will also have a chance to use one of my favorite cooking tools. This, if I could find it, where is my cookie scoop? Am I insane? Did somebody touch my cookie scoop? Um, 
Hello? Okay, there it is, aha, I found it. Everybody, we're gonna use this cookie scoop. And this is going to help us to make sure that it gets nice and separated. Okay, our lovely batter has nicely rested. And the tool that is going to make the spätzle, what it is everybody, is this. This tool right here. We put the dough, we put the batter inside, and then we get all of these lovely little bits of spätzle. And then after it gets cooked, it's going to go over a colander, and then it will be ready for consumption. We'll mix it up with the pesto in the bowl. It's gonna be delicious. Is everybody ready for this process? I wanna hear a nice yes chef. So, I would really recommend that you invest in one of these tools, guys. It's really simple, it's really easy to use. My water is boiling, my water is all ready to go. I'm going to just go ahead, I'm setting up my spätzle tool on it, okay? And we don't overfill this. I'm only going to do two to three little things of batter at a time, maybe two and a half these. Okay, that's it. Let that go. And now guys, just push it through, almost like a mandolin. Push it and push it and push it through. Push it, push it, push it, push it. All the way down, all the way inside. Okay, awesome. This is why it's so much easier to do this instead of making fresh pasta. Guys, there is no rolling, there is no kneading. This takes no cutting whatsoever. All you do, you mix up a batter, okay? And then it just goes through this little handy little tool. And that's all that it is. This is so easy, this is so accessible. All that you need to invest in is in this tool, which, I mean, it's really, really cheap, guys. You can buy it just about anywhere. I did also end up dropping a little bit onto the ground, and that's okay. So all that we're going to do is we're going to wait for it to flow to the top and then cook it for another minute or so. Also, uh, Tarina, how did that go? I would imagine the spätzle would be really small. They'd be like a little too small if you were to do something like that. Okay, guys, all the spätzle, they're beginning to now rise to the occasion. They're rising to the top. Look at my lovely little pastas. Look at my lovely little German dumplings. That is you. You're my lovely little German dumpling. They're all rising to the top, okay? And all they need is just like a good minute of boiling further, especially because we do drop the water temperature. Look how easy that was to make. Look how easy it was, everybody. Wasn't that easy? I wanna hear a nice yes, chef. This is why I wanna teach all of you how to do this at home. This is such an ideal, such an effective home food, everybody. Everybody should be making spätzle. Look at them, nice and bouncy and chewy. They look like little sperm sacks. Well, maybe that's not very appealing. Well, uh, stop, stop, done, okay? We're cooking them, 10 more seconds. We'll pull them out, we'll put them into the colander. We don't have to shock them, we don't have to do anything like that. We just have to put a little bit of oil in there to make sure that it doesn't, um, how do you say? Just to make sure that it doesn't particularly uh, stick to each other, okay? So let's go ahead and now take my lovely spätzle. Let's drop them all into my colander. Once again, I'm using my spider. It's such a good tool for the job. Just picks them all up in one or two or three fell swoops. Okay? Get all of that water off of them so that it all just stays in the confines of the pot. There you go. Awesome. And the only thing I'm going to do, guys, now that the spätzle has come out, a little bit of olive oil. A little bit of olive oil. Uh, it is just salt water, V8. Just plain old salt water. A little bit of olive oil will just go directly on the spätzle, and this just helps them to not stick as we wait for them to cool down, okay? Or rather, we wait to get done with all of them. Okay, so the water, we're bringing it up to an aggressive boil again. I'm just going to clean out the water with any of the little bits of dough that could be remaining, okay? We wanna get that water big uh, and up into a nice aggressive boil. So, Robert Bob, this is called a spätzle. It's not a pasta. And the reason I keep teaching it is because this is how you make uh, fresh pasta at home really, really easily. Well, something like a fresh pasta, rather. Mm, so delicious, everybody. So good. Mm, 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 mm. Beautiful. That water, it's now officially come back up to a lovely boil. Let's go ahead and get my spätzle tool on it one more time. And we gotta do two more batches of it or so, ready? So nice, big, big, big scoops using the cookie scoop because it's a really nice way of just getting it all off of the spatula, off of the spoon of choice. Okay, three big scoops. Okay, and now, also, spätzle would be so good with paprikash. 
So there's a reason why it reminds you of that, right? It would just be really delicious together. Guys, just press it out, press it out, press it out, press it out. Get all of it inside of the pot properly, please and thank you. All of it in, all of it in, all of it in. Okay. All of it in. Sometimes it'll drip over the edge if you're using the same tool that I have. My tool kind of sucks. I kind of want a better one, but that's okay. That's not a problem for today. Okay? And I'm going to just grab it before it drips anymore all over all of my surfaces. Okay? My spätzle is going, everybody. We're just mixing it around ever so slightly. And now all it needs is a minute of pure boiling time. We're 50 seconds at this point. Look at it. Look at it, guys. Look at that beautiful spätzle. It's all coming together. Okay? And then we'll just be plating and eating. That's all that we really have left to do after this, honestly. So, everybody, are you excited for the final product? Are you excited for this homemade pesto that we've created together, that we've given so much love and effort and attention to? Look at all of this spätzle rising to the top. Oh. Gorgeous, isn't it? Nice, long, beautiful strands. A little bit more cooking, and then we'll take them out. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. You really can't mess up with cooking these things. Yes, I do know that it has dough residue hanging off of it. This is a typical occurrence. Okay, guys, all of the spätzle out it comes. All of it, all of it out and into the colander once again. Okay, out and out. Ooh, these guys are nice and puffy today. They're nice and puffy, they're nice and beautiful and bouncy. Okay, and let's just get all the little scraps out as well. And let's get that water back up to a boil, and I'm going to mix them in with the existing olive oil. Everybody, one last batch of spätzle. I'm gonna need all of your energy. I'm gonna need all of your attention for this one, okay? Last one, let's finish strong. Water already back up to a nice boil. Let's get the rest of my batter inside. Let's finish it off, let's finish it off strong. One, and two, and all of it, all of it comes out now. But I'm not gonna hold it over for too long. I'm gonna waste a little bit, I'm okay with that because this does need to go now, okay? So, ready? And push it through, push it through, push it through. Push it through, push it through, push it through, push it through. Get it inside, everybody. Push it all the way through. Get all of it in, get all of it in, get all of it in. Okay? And I think that looks pretty good. Gorgeous. Guys, where's my cooking background from? Spartan, I have been cooking my whole life. I am entirely self-taught. I consider myself kind of like amateur professional, right? Professional in that like, you know, I don't work a restaurant job, so I don't really call myself a professional in that way, but I consider myself incredibly knowledgeable. But I'm just self-taught. So guys, all of it inside, all it really needs is just one more minute, and it will be perfect. I'm just agitating the previous spätzle. I'm making sure that all of this guy is all rising to the top. And then, my friends, we will eat. We will eat. We will plate. I do have a lot of knowledge, but you're absolutely right. I try very hard. All the spätzle rising to the top. 40 more seconds. 40 more seconds, and then we'll combine it with the homemade pesto. We'll top it off with some more Parmesan cheese, and then we'll also plate up the shrimp salad. The spätzle is cooking, it is hydrating. It's getting nice and bouncy and beautifully chewy. Mm, 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 mm. I love spätzle more than anything. It is so good, so good, it's crazy. Mm. Some Parmesan, awesome. Does it make a difference if a broth is used? Um, so V6, I actually think it might be a big waste of broth. It doesn't really tend to absorb flavor of the water as much as people think it does. Um, so I actually think it just might be a bit of a waste of your time is the only thing. Might be a bit of a waste of time and a waste of money. But, I mean, you can. You can. It's not going to ruin the spätzle. If anything, it'll only make it slightly better. But I personally wouldn't do it because it just seems a little wasteful and a little unnecessary. 
but then it'll also like taint the rest of your uh, broth with like the, you know, dough and stuff. So I personally wouldn't. I personally wouldn't do it, but also you do you. Guys, guess what? My spätzle is officially all done. My pesto is done. My shrimp salad is done. Also, gate man, you would do exclamation mark uh, wish list if you would like to help support. So guys, let's finish off the spätzle. I keep saying spätzle, I'm so tired of it. But it is time for us to finish and it's time for us to finish wrong. A nice generous portion for myself. And then everybody, you remember my homemade pesto? You remember this bad boy? Beautiful and creamy and gorgeous. We just add a dollop of it right inside and all that we need to do is just mix all of it in. Let's just take it and let's mix it in. Let's mix it in, let's mix it in. It's just going to get nice and creamy. It's going to combine and we're going to have a delicious spätzle. With this homemade, really aromatic, really beautiful pesto. Okay, let's just mix it up. Let's keep combining, let's keep combining. We don't want any pockets of pesto, guys. We just want my spätzle to be fully seasoned all the way throughout. Gorgeous. And again, we're not attacking the pesto with any additional heat. The spätzle is hot when it comes out, but we're not marrying it on a pan or anything. We're not doing anything crazy like that. All I'm doing is I'm just mixing it up with my fresh pesto, everybody. Look at it. Gorgeous. Okay. And last but not least, let's finish it with some fresh Parmesan cheese. Just right on top. Beautiful. And now guys, let's go ahead and plate up a little bit of shrimp salad as well for myself. I said this might be a short stream. I lied. It was another two and a half hour stream. This is a very normal length stream for us. At this point, at least. There you go. A nice, generous, healthy portion of shrimp salad. And now everybody, that is it. That is everything that we have done. And we have done everything homemade from scratch. So everybody, I need to hear another yes chef because I need your full and utmost attention. Let's start with the shrimp. Ooh, excuse me, let's start with the shrimp salad. Shrimp, beautifully poached. Yes chef from everybody watching. Shrimp, beautifully poached. Gently cooked, not rubbery. A dressing made out of garlic, lemon juice, lemon zest, and Dijon mustard. Freshly sliced basil some jalapenos, some tomatoes, some red onions, and charred corn under the broiler, nice and smoky, nice and sweet. This, my friends, is an incredible salad. Cheers. Mm. Mm. Oh my God. That is so good. And now guys, we made our own pesto, any more than pesto, any more cajete, the traditional way, with a lot of love, with a lot of care. Fresh basil, pine nuts, garlic, Parmesan cheese, a bunch of olive oil, and then we made homemade spätzle, everybody. This delicious German dumpling, I'm using it as a sub and fruit pasta. Super easy to do at home. And then we just topped it off with some Parmesan cheese. Cheers. Oh my God. That is incredible. That is one of the best things I've ever made. That is so good. Mm. And some. That's it. That is perfect. That spätzle is amazing. Okay, I get it. I'm rushing because I want to eat this off camera. Everybody, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for tuning in. Next stream is going to be tomorrow, May 1st, 5 p.m. EDT. And then I'm going to be off for a week. And then we'll be back Wednesdays, Fridays, and Sundays. I don't have the recipes on Patreon, so let's talk about Patreon really quickly. Um, Rec Remy, I'm going to talk to you why. The Patreon gives you nothing except a Patreon-exclusive Discord, and we even have a community Discord. The whole point of the Patreon is I do not believe in paywalling information. I want all of my information, I want all of my info to be free for everybody to consume, regardless of your income. The Patreon is purely if you would like to support what we do here. So for those of you that have the money to support uh, Patreon, please exclamation mark Patreon. I want to keep this free for everybody to watch and I want to keep all the information free. I don't want to paywall any info. I don't want to paywall any content. I want to just have this open and publicly available. And so the Patreon, I'm relying on the goodness of everybody's hearts. 
to just donate to. And the only thing that you get in return is knowing that you're supporting the show because I'm only here teaching techniques. So everybody, if you'd like to support the Patreon, please, I'm trying to do this full time one day. Any and all help with it would be really appreciated. Everybody, thank you all so much. I'm going to see you all tomorrow, 5 p.m. EDT, Wednesday, May 1st. Thank you all for stopping by. Have a good Tuesday night. Be safe, be well, and thank you for watching The Cooking Show. I will see you all tomorrow. Bye-bye.